Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll get uh, the meeting going. Uh, apologies uh, for the delay. Uh, I don't think I've ever been involved in a meeting ever that had PowerPoint where it actually started on time. So you can thank, uh, you can thank uh, our uh, wonderful knowledge on technology for this. And I'd say you're all hoping that we have a better uh, knowledge of high nature value farming than we do of technology, because if we don't, uh, you're doomed. So. Anyways, uh, just to introduce myself, Luke Ming Flanagan is my name. I'm uh, MEP for Midlands North West. Um, months back, I was at a meeting here uh, on forestry and uh, the discussion about whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, uh, the whole idea of the monoculture of Sitka spruce, etc. And I went away thinking to myself, we need to try <laughs> and find an alternative. And also in light of the fact that the common agricultural policy is currently under review and the fact that this presents opportunities for Leitrim, uh, I thought this was an opportune time to hold it. And when I say it presents opportunities for Leitrim, what I mean is if we have proper convergence this time and the money that was meant to go to lands like this goes to them this time, we are looking at potentially between 9 and 11 million euros more per year for Leitrim. Now, I'm a townie, and you might say, if you're a townie yourself and you don't work on a farm, what benefit is that to you? Well, I think it's time people who are townies open their eyes to the fact that when farmers make money, they spend money locally. When the grant money comes to the right people, the money will trickle down. And that 11 or 9 million euro will not stay in the farmer's pocket. It will end up in the pockets of hairdressers, not for me, obviously. It'll end up in the pockets of carpenters, like my father in the past, putting in fitted cupboards, etc. And it will end up where it should be, filtered through the farmer. So. That's why it's so important to organize now and hold such an event. And we have, I believe, an ace in the pack around here. It could be seen as the joker in the pack if it's not played well by us and by uh, the European Union. And the ace in the pack that we have is that the European Union appears to be going down the road of benefiting these lands and giving more monies to these areas. So now is the time to fight for it. So I have a short piece to, uh, to read out to you and then we'll go to our speakers. High nature value is a relatively new concept that describes the farming systems of Europe of the highest biodiversity value, namely around here. High nature value farming is characterized by long established, low intensity and often complex farming systems. It utilizes local knowledge and uses livestock breeds and crop types highly adapted to local soils, vegetation and climate. This is an important event in advance of the CAP Reform 2020, on which discussions are already underway in Brussels. It is important from two aspects. If we are to meet our target in climate mitigation, we must maximise our assets and our ability to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Equally important, we are to defend the cap. if we are to defend the CAP budget, we must show that we are serious in our commitment to environmental measures. And that is very, very relevant now, given the news that has come out that it will be cut, uh, single farm payments will be cut by up to 4% and the agricultural budget will be cut by 5%. That is why now it is such an important time to prove and at the right time to prove that money needs to go to this area, but for money to continue to going into farming, it's got to go into the right areas. And one of the strongest arguments for cutting at the, it at the moment in the Agriculture Committee and all the other committees is that it didn't go to the right place and it didn't come to areas like this. So in theory, we have them on side. The conference also aims to encourage farmers to look at their land in a new light. We must move away from the notion in stillness from an early age that the only worthwhile land and therefore the only land worthy of support is an acre of prime pasture land <laughs> on an acre of tillage land or an acre of tillage land. Every acre 
of Ireland in Ireland has its vital role to play in overarching goals of food production, the provision of public goods, and this is vital. We provide public goods around here on climate mitigation, on water quality, and on biodiversity. These public goods that agriculture provides are not paid for by the market, and they include, as I've said, agricultural landscapes, farmland biodiversity, GHG mitigation, reduced risk of flooding and fires, water quality, as in no contamination by pesticides or leaching on fertilizers, water availability, maintaining groundwater levels, food security, reducing dependence on potentially unstable imported food change. It is indeed the case that the most intensive sectors in agriculture trade on the green image created by the efforts of farmers managing our high nature value lands. This is also true for our tourism industry that benefit from the landscape created by others, namely yourselves. The conference also aims to challenge farmers to think outside the box, to no longer look at Natura designations, and I've got to look at myself here as well, or working with difficult terrain as a constraint, but rather as a marketing advantage, drawing attention to the pristine commodities. There is huge potential for quality branded niche products aimed at high value markets within Ireland and the EU. In our highly connected world of internet selling and online shopping, a short supply chain is not limited to distance or local markets as may have been the case in the past. A short supply chain can now mean produced in Ackle Island or produced in Leitrim and sold in Brussels just as easily as it is sold here or sold in Mulrani. The link up here with the highly successful Wild Atlantic Way is obvious, creating food trails and other spin-offs, and also the type of marketing they're trying to do in this area. It's also not necessary to reinvent the wheel to achieve these aims. Many of the farming practices currently being carried out are sustainable uh, from an agricultural and indeed from an environmental perspective. All good farmers understand the need for conservation, although they may not call it that. The importance of rotation, being crop or grazing, allowing the land to recover is well recognized and predated the current concepts of conservation agriculture by thousands of years. You know the phrase, being put out to grass. What is not sustainable and must be challenged is the lack of support for farmers who work and manage these lands. And that is why now is the time to talk about this and to get that money that should have come to these areas. These lands must be farmed in order that they be maintained in optimal condition and supports are available within the common agricultural policy to do this. As the debate on the next round of CAP kicks off, farmers must demand and insist that their lands and contribution are valued and supported realistically. Guest speakers at the conference this evening are Mr. Humberto Delgado Rosa from DG Envy. We have a senior researcher on rural development from Chagas, Anya Mac and Walsh. And we also have a policy advisor from the World Agroforestry Centre, Patrick Verms. Um, we're here to try and learn of these people, to try and take what we can out of them. We're not just leaving it here today, having a conference, moving on and saying goodbye, didn't I attract lots of attention. That's not what this is about. We're also traveling around Leitrim tomorrow with Patrick Burns to look at the possibility of developing agroforestry in this area. We're going meeting a variety of farmers. After that, we're not going to leave it there. You might be familiar with the forestry strategy 2014 to 2020. There was a mid-term review done on it. I'm not that impressed with the mid-term review that's done on it, but me saying I'm not impressed with it isn't a document to bring to someone to get them to change it. So what we aim to do over the next weeks or couple of months is to put together an alternative to that plan using the knowledge that Patrick Verms has and the massive support that I get as an MEP to go out there and pay for such reports. So we hope within the next month to actually produce a report out of the visits that we undertook today to the farms, out of what's said here, out of what questions you ask us, what ideas you put to us, and hopefully, and ideally, and essentially, because we've got to make this happen, because we want to stay living here, we want to stay working the land, we want this place to remain sustainable. And to do that, we need a plan. 
this is the beginning of that. So the first person up to speak here tonight is uh, Anya Macken Walsh from uh, Chagas. She'll give you her exact title herself and we'll take it from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. My name is Anya Macken Walsh. I'm a sociologist. I work for Chagas. I'm based in Athen Rye. So I'm one of the team in Athen Rye in the Social Science Centre there. Um, and I focus mostly on the human side of things. So what farmers like, how they make decisions, their values and that kind of thing. I'll speak into the mic. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, just to fix this situation here once more so you can see it. Um, a couple of years ago, I was invited to be part of a focus group in the European Commission focused on high nature value farming. And I remember, you know, we all assembled, it's many of you, may, or some of you at least, maybe have, have been involved in these types of focus groups before. There were farmers there and policy makers and some researchers and um, a mix of people and that's what they're designed to be. And the farmers who were, we were presented with this report about all the facts and figures about high nature value farming. And on the cover of the report, there was this picture. And the farmers in particular in the room, now they were from all over Europe, took great exception to this photo. And they said, this doesn't represent us at all. That's a kind of a banjaxed machine there that he's operating. Uh, it looks like something out of the last century. And that doesn't, doesn't represent who the high nature value farmer is. Now, we also had a discussion about, you know, the conservation farmer and what that means. And they weren't comfortable really with any of those labels. Um, so it was changed to something like this, and that was more acceptable to some farmers. But I don't think Irish farmers would necessarily relate to that picture either. But of course, we know that HNV land and you know these types of breed of animals you know they're they're not our breeds that is a kind of a a romanticized version of what HNV high nature value farming is and it doesn't really represent us and as Luke already mentioned you know um, high nature value farm farmland isn't all that rare in Ireland there is a relatively you know, at least a mediocre probability that it, exi it exists in the majority of the country. So HNV land, or whatever you might wish to call it, it can be actually more ordinary and typical um, than those types of pictures that we saw earlier that people mightn't relate to. And the, But the reality on, on a lot of these farms, however, is certainly far, far from romantic. And with incomes on smaller farms in Ireland lower than €2,900 annually, and on larger farms, not much better, at about over uh, just their 14970 that's on, on the larger farms, certainly it's not a very romantic picture. And because we're in the northwest this evening, these are the figures relating to uh, the area that, enco that encompasses this particular geographical area. And it's, it, it's worth mentioning here, as, as clearly evidenced here, the, the, um, the average incomes in this area are no different really to the national trend. And more than half of farm households um, uh, on average are dependent on off-farm income. So that comes as no surprise to you, but these are the, the latest available statistics. But these farms, these very farms, those with these low incomes and those dependent on off-farm income, it's also the case that these more extensive farms are located in areas that are more likely to have high nature value land, such as in the west of Ireland, where these sheep were photographed in only a couple of days ago and posted on Facebook on the Wild Atlantic Way. And farms located where I, where I live myself in areas such as the west of Ireland and in so-called marginal areas, they survive, and we know this from studies, well over a hundred years, they, re they survive, survive as a result of a very skilled and delicate balancing act. A balancing act that occurs at various levels and research has shown that profit maximization or the pursuit of short-term goals, making the quick buck, 
that's not prevalent at all in family farming. That tendency is very much tempered by farmers' social priorities, the value they place on their relationships with their family, within their communities, and also their own sense of pride in farming. And often those, you can see trends and types of pride in communities, what it means to be a good farmer, to the farmer him or herself, and within a particular community. This can be shared among members of a, of a, of a community. And we've studied this for, for uh, so various philo philosophers over 100 years. And we know that relationships, relationships, these are at the core of sustainability and of sociological understandings of, understandings of sustainability. The sustainable family farm is a farm who successfully produces a successor to take the farm over. And for that, for that to happen successfully, Farming needs to mean something to that person. There needs to be a relationship between the successor with the land and between the successor and the animals. This is an important part of what people call and refer to on an everyday basis as the love of farming, basically. That's what drives farmers, and it happens from a very young age. We know that from the age of two and three. And then there's the relationship, leaving the humans out of it altogether. There's the relationship between the animals and between the animals and the land, another very, very delicate balance that's particularly relevant to places like this and places like the burn. And hundreds of farmers, in fact, I have records, have described these important relationships to me. And even in yesterday's Irish Farmers Journal, there is a, a lovely article, and it's a farmer from Dingle, and he describes the way in which successive generations of yos and their daughters have had their own family patch on the mountain down there. And they teach each other and they hand each the knowledge down on how to graze in that mountain. And he said, money couldn't buy that. It, it's worth reading. But, and all the parts of this complex and delicate balancing act, the inculcation of commitment, pride, and social esteem in the family, and very importantly, the willingness to invest hard work, relentless work, gruelling work sometimes. There's no off switch on the farm. It's a living entity. And this is not an aspect, this hard work, that is often discussed in the context of sustainability. But there is no sustainability without the human commitment to that land and to those animals. And international studies have shown that the farming way of life, the family farming way of life distinctively, and it is very distinctive, that it's handed down from generation to generation and it has proven itself to be remarkably resilient and tenacious. And we can see that. that we can see how long has land been held by a certain family for you know, several hundred years in some cases. But also, we know even from figures, official figures, that show that less than 1% of agricultural land is sold on the open market annually in Ireland. And that trend didn't change throughout the Celtic Tiger. And a main part since I joined Chagas 12 years ago, um, I've been tasked with res various research briefs, but a, a main part of that has been to try and explain, for instance, you know, why farmers haven't adopted some of the latest technologies and practices that have been developed by science, Chagas scientists included, and promoted by my own organization, Chagas. Practices and technologies that are said to increase profitability and efficiency in agriculture. You know, why, why aren't some of these practices, quite a few of them, not being taken up by farmers? And then another group might ask, Anya, you know, perhaps a research project is warranted. Why aren't farmers up taking up these conservation practices, uh, what we call conservation practices? And it's interesting that on one side, um, the, the perception might be that the farmers don't want to improve their profitability. Um, but on the other side, the, the, the perception is that, that it's the opposite. So these two camps can be actually, uh, they don't really see each other's perspectives. But rather than pursuing that angle, it's often far better to just focus on the farmer and figure out the farmer's logic about how they make decisions. And this, as I've already said, does represent inherited knowledge, not just an evaluation of the latest science. Um, 
And we can find out an awful lot through a farmer's eyes how he, he or her judges the latest um, scientific uh, knowledge that is presented to them. And they certainly don't just accept the knowledge, but they judge it, they interrogate it, and they judge it on the basis of past experiences and, and, and also the, the experiences of their forebears. But this process of actually analysing the farmer's logic and what is the preferred and possible action that the farmer wishes to take on his or her farm, considering their conditions, this was actually the magic ingredient of the Burren Life Programme, the original uh, life programme in Ireland. And that's exactly how the, how the people who were involved in the initial stages, that is how they describe it. And we did see another example of that today with James Moore and, and, and that team, um, of how to make, to put that at the centre. What, is, what are the conditions on the farm? What are the menu of possibilities that can be taken uh, that suit this particular farm, considering the farmer's existing practices? So reflecting a little bit more on our, day, our, on our day today, we were out in farms, we saw the landscape, and I, I occasionally hear, hear a view that's often just kind of said, that if a good enough incentive is given out to farmers, you know, a high enough, say, financial incentive, that farmers will take it, no matter what it is, they'll adopt it and they'll take it up. Well, I don't agree with that at all, I have to say. But a more accurate version of it is, if the relationship between is broken between the farm family and the land and the farm, if that is broken, and we must remember that this relationship is, as I've already described it, is not just one of profit maximization. It's a relationship that's social in nature, that's bound up in the farmer's pride, and it involves this delicate balancing act because that's what we know it involves. If that is broken, that is when the land becomes vulnerable to either disposal or sale, um, because there is no successor or, or the, the way of farming life has kind of lost its mean meaning, or else the pursuit of short-term goals occurs. So we know that well. But another way in which the, the, um, the link may be broken, this important relational balancing act between the family farm and the, and the farmland and animals, well, we must, you know, not ignore the way in which a significant proportion of family farms now are dependent on our farm income. And that has worked quite well. And I don't know if you saw David McWilliams wrote uh, a paper there or an article in the press and he called it, you know, the children of small farm families will inherit the earth because they've prov proven to balance, you know, their the most highly educated cohort in the country when it comes to third level education. Uh, they have off-farms job, off farms jobs, they are highly skilled, and yet they're farming and they're juggling all of this. But is that going to last? I'm just putting that question out there. Um, and in the context of poor economic returns and often very poor recognition farmers feel and for their farming practices, do threats arise from this reliance on off-farm labour? Does, does, is there a threat on that valuable relationship between the farm family and the land? Is it certain that the same type of knowledge and commitment that has been handed down from generation to generation, is that going to weaken at all as a result of this focus on our, on, on our farm work? Is it? But there is another threat as well, <coughs> and it's, it's, it's a long-standing threat, and that's the presence of a culture where there can be very derisory attitudes towards the small farm. Although these farms, these extensive smaller farms, they were found in a nationally representative survey last year conducted by Chagas to, to have fewer carbon emissions than larger, more intensive farms. There is still prevails this type of derisory attitude. <coughs> where they, are they more as valued in Irish society, within the farming community as well, and by farming organisations? Are they as valued as the large dairy farmer? And why not? Why aren't they as valued? In other countries, the small farmer, the independent farmer, is highly valued. And Irish society maybe needs to think a little bit about that. And there can be a perception in Irish society also, and in fact a great person who has always talked about this is President Higgins, that in the face of big problems and big challenges, there can be this kind of uh, perception, oh, that it's almost natural 
or divinely ordained, or we can't come up against it? And is there anything we can do? And this type of attitude can prevail when it comes to farmers being price takers for their products, particularly in the dry stock sector. And that's the most concerning of all, that if that kind of hopelessness sets in, what effect will that have for future generations and their survival? That is a major concern. And I'll finish with just mentioning a piece of what I think is very important legislation, um, which is the Beef Producer Organisation uh, legislation that was uh, introduced last year. And I haven't really heard or seen many people to discuss this in public fora, and which, is, which is, I think, quite unfortunate. So for farmers who occupy that middle ground between the large farm that's profitable as a result of economies of scale and the smaller, more boutique artisan producer that produces cheese and therefore increases value added and, and their income. For the people, in, in, you know, that typical HNV farmer in Ireland, the extensive farmer, working off farm, skilled, highly educated family. This producer organisation legislation offers the opportunity for those farmers to group together and to form a marketing organisation to arrange joint processing facilities, etc., etc., and bring their product directly to market and establish a brand. Now, I think what is particularly useful and suitable to Ireland about this legislation is it doesn't expect individual farmers, or say five farmers, to set up their own brand, to organise their own processing facilities, to engage with retailers, which is in very time consuming. And it can be a very unrealistic expectation of farmers who are already spending all of their time um, and are very skilled in agricul agricultural production. Excuse me. Um, so this, this legislation offers farmers to collectively buy in that type of expertise. Uh, the POs are already operational in countries such as Spain. A single beef producer organisation in Spain markets the same uh, amount, volume of beef that Ireland produces nationally. At the moment, producer organisations sell 30% of Ireland's horticultural produce. And when you look at the dairy sector, the dairy sector is almost entirely represented by farmer cooperatives. So it isn't all that unusual. Um, but one, another thing I think is very good about these POs is they, what is important to farmers, and I know this could be a stereotype, and maybe there's one or two of you who mightn't feel that this is important to you, but in ev any evidence I've seen, the animal is very important to the farmer. The investment and commitment and work that has gone into those animals. And it is important for the farmer, in addition to whatever payment that they get for maintaining HNV land, high nature value land, it is important that they get a fair price for that animal, considering its exceptional quality and the investment that has been made in it. Um, and that's very important for farmers' values and for motivating them to stay farming and doing the fantastic job that all, many of them do, the vast majority. Thank you. I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you, uh, Anya. Next up is uh, Humberto Delgado from uh, DG Envy. And just on what Anya said on the producers, uh, the producer groups, producer organisations, uh, I think it's, it's a massively important point. It, to me, it's, it's basically the slingshot in the hand of David to take down Goliath, and it's what's needed. And there is, we're going further in the European Union with legislation to guarantee that basically we don't have a situation where suppliers can send you stuff back just before it goes off. They can't change terms of contract, etc. And there's also further legislation proposed, Phil Hogan tells us it's going to happen, whereby there'll be more transparency in the system, as in we will know what Tesco's, etc. and these organisations are paying for uh, the produce, etc. So that is going in the right direction. But anyways, we'll go over to Humberto Delgado. Next. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you very much, Luke. Yeah. First of all, good evening. Let me tell you a bit more about myself. I'm Humberto Delgado Rosa, and I'm uh, in the DG environment in the European Commission. I have a responsibility for what we call natural capital, which is, by one side, land use 
forestry, agriculture, and its relationship with nature, biodiversity policy, nature conservation, and also the LIFE program, with the, which is a program that finances uh, climate and environment. But I'm also a townie, and more than that, also an aerocrat. And I'll tell you, there's nothing I like most nowadays, which is going outside and dealing with real people, their concerns, especially farmers, because there's quite a lot the, of what farmers do and their concerns that are directly related to our policies or are in, important for us. So I was thrilled today to have the chance to go there and have some good Irish mud in my, in my trousers here to, to remind me w much of what I've listened today. So I was asked to comment on the economic value of Natura 2000. I'll say a bit more on Natura 2000 and I'll go towards the economic value, but before that let me put a a bit the context, why should we worry about nature and biodiversity? Well, we just walk around and you see all this greeny. Uh, it, there's, there seems to be a lot of it, so what's the problem? Well, to put it simply, the state of the natural world out there in, the, in all this nice planet is far from good. And the issue is the more we expand in the planet and we develop and we, we try to bring economic prosperity to our societies, the more we erode nature. And we intuitively, we know that we can't really be sustainable if we keep doing it. And that does not happen only in tropical forests or coral reefs. No, no, it happens in Europe. And we are not uh, the poorest part of the world, are we? So we, if we can't succeed on sustaining the loss of biodiversity, what can we say to the poor Africans out there or in Asia or elsewhere? So it's a serious issue. And it also happens in Ireland. And I have a couple of examples that were brought to my attention that maybe ring a bell to you. Uh, I'm sure that older members of the audience will have been familiar with the once widespread corn creek, which is now quite a silent voice over nearly all of Ireland, as far as I'm informed. Or the curlew. Now it looks as if it's heading towards a similar fate as a breeding bird in Ireland. So you see, in biodiversity, there's not these catastrophes that... Uh, raises the awareness as you can have uh, with an extreme weather event reminding climate change, but it's slowly, slowly and slowly being eroded. And if you all agree that that's important not to keep this loss, then of course we need policies to address it. That's where Natura 2000 comes in. What is it? You, you probably know about it. It's, let's say, it's the flagship of European policy for conservation. It emanates from two directives, the Birds Directive and the Habitats Directive. And to put it sim simply, it's, it aims to be a sample of the best habitats to protect the species of EU concern all over Europe. So it's the largest structured network of protected sites with over 27 or 28,000 sites all over Europe. It's the largest in the world. And it, although I'm t I told you we are losing biodiversity in Europe also. Well, Natura 2000 is giving a hand. Things go better in Natura 2000 than elsewhere. But let me tell you a, a, a little story on a farmer versus Natura 2000 so that we understand the tensions around it. I have happened to know and become a friend of a Belgian landowner and farmer, which now proudly has a flag of Natura 2000 in his property. But his first contact with Natura 2000 was far from good. His father had just passed away, so at the funeral just happened, and he received a phone call from someone from a Belgian NGO telling him, we want to buy your land. You know, now you can't do anything any longer. You can't hunt or farm because there's Natura 2000, so you must step aside. So he was totally outraged. He had never heard about it. So he actually read the directive. And in the end, he said, well, but I agree with everything that's in the directive. It was the practice that was the malpractice. And I think there's, we have concluded also in the Commission, there's a mismatch between the, fit, fit per, per, um, the fitness for purpose of the directives, which still stand, and the implementation, which often is far from good. So my main message on this is Natura 2000 is not at all about strict um, reserves where we want to put humans aside, on the contrary is to keep human activity that is compatible and often needed to keep nature. That's the essence of the concept of Natura 2000. I'm pretty much aware that this concept is, well, was not put in practice everywhere in the right way. 
And often, instead of saying to the farmers or the foresters, well done, you've preserved the nature, you deserve congratulations, keep it going, it was kind of said, ha-ha, now you have restriction and that's all. So, but now let's be honest on one thing. Natura 2000 is also about restriction in the sense that, of course, it exists to, to, to stop some practice or to be an obstacle to malpractices but not a support to other practices. And we should have this clear. But it is all conceived to mm, influence the use of the, uh, of the land in a way that usually that's what war farmers were doing because that's why you have nature there. Of course, we cannot come, and that's not at all in spirit directives, to say to the member states what they should do to manage the land. It's up for the member states and the authorities in Ireland, actually. It's the, the mm, mm, National Parks and Wildlife Service, which is the, which is the mm, authority responsible. It's up for the authorities to devise how they will address conservation. But we strongly recommend that's done through management plans that should be discussed and shaped with stakeholders, and especially those stakeholders that live from the land, the, farm, the landowners, the, the farmers, the hunters, that make a living from the land. Now, those are somehow special stakeholders, and we, are now have, we now have a nature action plan that will go until 2018 to be developed with the member states, where we pretty much favor and promote this approach of involving, you know, involvement. Now, getting to the economics, I was requested to say, speak a bit of the, the economic value of Natura 2000. There's one sense where it truly has a lot of economic value because <coughs> if you take into account the several ecosystem services, I'll be saying a bit more about ecosystem services, it provides all over Europe, it's estimated at 200 to 300 billion euros per year. That's huge, isn't it? Well, of course, not all of this is income that can be captured into our pockets. It's, um, I'll give you the examples. What are these ecosystem services, just to, to pick some of this flow of ecosystem services. Actually, some were referred by Luke previously. If we consider storing carbon, which is so much important <coughs> to mitigate and address climate change. Well, much of Natura 2000 network provides quite a lot of carbon storage, particularly in pit bogs that are especially relevant in the quantity of carbon they can store. That's one example. Or water. You can imagine how much money can be saved through having nature doing the work of providing water purification and provisioning costs that uh, uh, would have a, a cost for water companies. So the removal of pollutants, the availability of water and the quality of water, that's a service that nature provides us, including the Dura 2000. Then you have, of course, food quality and provision. That's pretty much the work that farmers do, but there's nature also doing it. Think of pollinators that have been declining everywhere in Europe. Well, uh, it's many billions per year the value of their work, the pollinators that provide us. And we, I can announce you also, you may have seen there was some pesticides banned recently in Europe because of pollination. We will be coming pretty soon with a new initiative to support the recovery of pollinators in Europe. And another example is leisure and tourism. Natura 2000 is proving to be a very important mo motor of local economies by attracting tourists that like to go and see nature. Many of the townies like to go and hike and see nature. Well, the issue, of course, first, not all ecosystem services, and there are many others, are actually monetizable. We cannot convert them all how much money that values. A lot of them we can. And others, even when we can convert in, in value, we can not always generate the financial flow that could compensate adequately those that manage the land towards keeping these ecosystem services. But some of these ecosystem services can be actually monetized, captured, and converted into, mo uh, into money flows. One can imagine flows of tourism revenue being used also to keep the management of land. You can imagine what the companies, and there are examples in Europe, available to pay for the appropriate management of the land because they will, have, they will save costs if this is done. And you can imagine the carbon markets actually capturing well enough what's the carbon um, storage that mm, bogs or other uses of the land can give in. So this is, let's say, one avenue of hope, if you want, 
how can we better compensate and pay the services that notably farmers in high nature value areas provide. For this, we need, of course, still quite some knowledge for some of the ecosystem services. And I will bring two elements of what we are doing. There's a Europe-wide exercise that we call mapping and assessing ecosystems and ecosystem services, which aims to know where are the ecosystems, in what shape, in what condition, and what's the condition of the services they are providing more developed in some countries than others. And is that will fuel also an initiative that will bring after the summer, which will be guidance on how to incorporate ecosystem services into decision making at whatever level, national level, regional level, local level, business level, just tools and guidance. How can I take into account this economic flow that sometimes it's invisible to our eyes, but it's a public good, which is extremely important. So, now, of course, if we want to keep the conservation goals of EU legislation and the ecosystem services it provides, we do need an effort to keep managing nature and to manage it even better for restoration when, when that's needed. That's the only way to, to safeguard Europe's biodiversity and to maximize these values. Uh, for this, it's fundamental to have more recognition that key players for these ecosystems are the farmers and the, la the landowners. This must be more recognized and acknowledged. And actually, the next common agriculture policy, there are some signs, and I'll refer to them now, that they will be more results-based. And if it's more results-based, that's one step further into allowing to recognize these elements um, uh, of what ecosystem services mean and how they are valued. Now, the debate on the reform of the common agriculture policy is ongoing, so the decisions are not yet taken. Yet, you can find in the communication that the Commission has delivered on the future of food and farming some important messages. We know there will be a stronger, a stronger link between the common agriculture policy and nature and environment and climate. It should help bring a a real transition to a more sustainable agriculture, we will have a more results-based common agriculture policy with an enhanced level of ambition for climate and environment. And a very important element, it should address policy coherence, meaning the cap, sh when it addresses the environment, it should be to contribute directly to the environmental goals and targets of the EU uh, and member states legislation, and not something aside from it. There's something on the new delivery model still to be defined, so we can't be sure right now of what we will get. But there's quite a, a chance that this next cap can deliver better for nature and uh, biodiversity um, objectives, and particularly to high nature value farmland, and especially in the two to 2000 areas. That's where part of the visit we've done today is so important, which was this pilot project on results-based payments that shapes a bit of way, the way of how this could be addressed in the future, making life easier for the farmer, for public administration, and delivering better results. When nowadays this, this command and control is saying to the farmer, you must keep X meters and mow this in this period of the year, you can't do this, you can't do that, expecting to have the, rule, the, the good results. Well, usually the farmer knows better how to deliver the results. So if we, if we rather say to the farmer, well, deliver us more butterflies or more plants or whatever, and you'll get your payment, you know better what to do. Here's some guidance and some simple method to measure and monitor. Well, I think that changes the, the, the picture psychologically for the farmer because he's again empowered to do with his land what he sees better. That's what I've liked the most of what we've listened today in our visit on this <laughs> element. Um, now, aiming to, to stop, what I think is now the, the fundamental point is there's quite a good chance of having a cap that more clearly steers towards taking into account uh, nature in, in farmland. Um, for this, of course, there there's one first go, which is what will the Commission propose? That's what we are debating now, internal to the Commission. And I hope that we get to a good result. 
there will be then two fundamental players to finally get it, because we don't decide alone in the European Commission. We have the member states and the Council of Ministers, and we have the Parliament, of course. So that's where I think it's very important that you take your destiny in your hands and you influence Irish authorities, Irish MEPs, Irish, uh, the, the Irish government, your voice on what you think is needed. And there's an, an important exercise now going, you know, the member states must establish their priorities and investment needs for a natural 2000 areas. That's ingrained in what we call the prioritized action frameworks. That's the name, the name we give to these frameworks where the member states decide, well, our investment needs are this and that. We intend to do, to make this existence of these paths, prioritized action frameworks, a conditionality for the EU funding. So that's a good stimulus to have these revised prioritized action frameworks. So I would encourage you very much through your representative bodies to engage in this process in Ireland because it can be pretty important to take into account in a different way what you may uh, feel a need here. A very final thought is an, another element of hope in my view which uh, runs as follows. We know the world of agriculture is complex. There are several kinds of agriculture and several views of what's the right agriculture. To put in extremes, one of such views is that you that sees, well, agriculture is about intensification, feeding the world, competing, and that's the name of the game. And there's another view which is, no, 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 European agriculture is about small-scale local farming quality next to the consumer, next to nature. These two views will keep competing. The sign of hope is, well, what do you think most Europeans would like to see more in their plate? Is it intensive agriculture, more lab, more molecules, more techniques, more drones and more robots? Or is it more nature, whatever that means? For many people, it's more nature. So many urbanites, many townies, where most of the votes are actually have an instinct of being aligned with this high nature value farming that they don't understand. So I think the role for you, those that live in these areas, is don't expect just the townies to come and understand everything. Approach them. There's <coughs> some a potential alliance there, and the winds of history, I think, will blow in this direction. I hope quickly enough to have a right cap in the next phase. I hope it needs to become up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Umberto. Uh, when I was at that meeting here on the forestry, and some people afterwards were saying, well, you know, it was painted very black and white, forestry is bad, no forestry is good. I don't think anyone was saying that. What really people were saying was, there's a good way to do things, and there's a bad way to do things. And there's a good way to engage in forestry, and there's a bad way to engage in forestry. And the person that I thought of was uh, to maybe come and talk about that was a man called Patrick Worms, who's with us now from the World Agri-Forestry Institute. And uh, I've seen several presentations from Patrick, and uh, you don't get an awful lot of hope when you hear an awful lot of the commentary on farming and agriculture, but I have to say I got a lot of hope out of what this individual said. Uh, Ideally, he would have come yesterday, but uh, a problem occurred, and the idea was that we would travel around parts of Leitrim with him so he'd have more knowledge before he talked to you. He's going to do that tomorrow. He'll be feeding into the study uh, over the next couple of months, but uh, I'll present him to you now. Uh, Patrick Worms, thank you. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> now, I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, that if there's something that impresses me about Ireland, it is you. It's Friday night. You could be in the pub. You could be out in the clubs with your, well, for most of you, with your sons and daughters. <laughs> but you chose to be here. That shows commitment. And it shows commitment to the betterment of the farming of the world. And you are allowed to fall asleep after, why am I not seeing this? Sorry. Hey. 
Now, I was going to say, it is Friday night, it is 9 p.m. Most of you are probably quite tired. You are allowed to fall asleep after this slide, as long as you remember these four key words. The future of agriculture is trees. And I'm going to prove it to you by asking you to all stand up. Yeah, stretch those legs. Now lift those arms and close your eyes. Those arms are the boughs of the beautiful trees you have in this landscape. And now the wind is coming in off the sea and these boughs are moving. And you are moving at the waist and the boughs are moving black and forth and they're not breaking but... Oh, and then the wind stops, the sun is coming out again, your arms come down. You're allowed to open your eyes and to sit down again. Thank you. <laughs> now, agroforestry. First, who are we? Who am I? Well, I work for a thing called the World Agroforestry Center. And what you see there is lots of pretty dots that show where we have our regional centers. We're a research institution. We're about 550 scientists, and we study the role of trees in agricultural landscapes in order to improve the productivity of agriculture. And you'll notice there's two conspicuously missing continents there. There's Europe and there's North America. That's why our mandate is to work mostly with poor farmers. And we've been doing it for 40 years. And the extraordinary thing is that the science that's been done at our headquarters in Nairobi, which is the, 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 the yellow dot over there and in the other places, is so advanced it's now finding application in Europe. It's the only field of scientific inquiry I know of where Africa is more advanced than Europe. And why is that so important? First, because agriculture is a seriously lousy business. Look at the amount of resources it consumes. Half of global employment, two-thirds of global land use, three-quarters of global freshwater use, one-third of global greenhouse gas emissions. No, your Prius is not going to save the planet, but land restoration might. But less than 5% of global GDP. How many of you are farmers here? Raise your hands. Well, I admire you. But let me tell you, you must be mad, honestly. This is why we look at farming from two perspectives. First, the economic perspective. Everything we do, whether it's greening tree crop landscapes or understanding how to improve the productivity of orchards or creating resilient systems in the face of climate change, has to be profitable. It has to be economically valuable or farmers won't do it. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking to some guy who has a thousand hectares of wheat in France or a guy who has half an acre of maize in Rwanda, the thinking is substantially the same. But because we're agroforesters, we also want to make it sustainable. That means that everything we do has to be resilient. It has to improve resilience. It has to improve ecological value of trees. It has to restore land. And it has to bring productivity up in a resilient way. Would you pass me a glass of water, please? Well, indeed. And we may think that these are mostly issues for the poor parts of the world, where land degradation is such a major problem. But land degradation is not just something that you see here. Land degradation is also something you see in the breadbaskets of the world, in the Brazilian Cerrado, in the American Midwest, in the black soils of Ukraine, and in China. Everywhere in the world, large-scale mechanized agriculture, which delivers on a narrow set of metrics, fails to deliver on the future that we all need, the future of our children. Now, we are mostly based in Africa, and in Africa, our problem is worse. We've, by 2050, 30 years down the road, we've got a double world food, uh, sorry, African food production. We've got to do that on the same amount of land. We've got to make these fields, these farms, these landscapes more resilient to extreme weather, and we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, colleagues in development have been doing this for the last 50 years or so. How have they managed? Lousily. The productivity of sub-Saharan African farms is exactly where it was in the 1960s, whereas in Latin America, Asia, South Asia, East Asia, it has massively improved. Why is that? First, because most traditional farming systems were based around trees, and then the colonialists came and they said, trees, haha, don't be silly, please clear all this rubbish from the field so we can have a nice big thing that can be planted with a tractor. Second, um, the system's fertility was restored through fallowing, and fallowing systems typically mean leaving the land alone for 15 to 20 years. That's fine when population densities are low, but population densities in Africa are very, very high. In sub-Saharan Africa, in Niger, for example, the average woman has 7.6 kids. 7.6 kids. And she has been having 7.6 kids since the 1960s. So in those environments, traditional farming systems disappear. So fertility is disappearing. People have no money for fertilizer, so 
life is getting hard. So where is that fertility going to come from? Well, if you listen to some people, it's going to come from massive investment in fertilizer. Well, yes, maybe, except that, here's an example from Zambia, most of African soils are so degraded, they're extremely acidic. And as you know well, acidic soils are lousy at making nutrients available to crop plants. So you could fix that. You could do what the Brazilians have done in the Cerrado and just lime the shit out of everything. But this is a road map of Zambia. What you see there is every single metalled road outside of the cities. This is a giant country. Most of the time, the roads look like this. Now, in that environment, good luck to get a truck to get to every farm with that lime and those fertilizers. And before we forget, Africa is absolutely enormous. It's as big as the European Union, India, China, and the US put together. So where is that fertility going to come from? Well, as we've discovered, it's going to come from trees. And this is not a joke. If you look at a map like this one, which shows you where there are trees on agricultural landscapes, so not in forests, and you compare it to a map like this one, which shows you where humans are actually living on this planet, you see that there's a strong correlation. And the reason for that is because farmers know that trees work for their living. Everywhere in the world. Here's a wheat walnut system in France. Here is a timber coffee system in uh, Nicaragua. The next time you go to Southeast Asia on holiday or you go to India, you will fly over southern Russia, and if you look out the window, you will see this. Giant hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of these windbreaks around cereal fields. And wonderful research was done by Soviet scientists, sadly it's not been translated into English, but it's all available, showing that the increase in the productivity of the wheat there is in the region of 15%, simply because of the windbreak effect. And here, the ladies here will certainly know how good shea butter is for your skin. It comes from those trees, and it's a classic agroforestry system. You plant crops under it, and then when you've harvested the crops, you let the animals eat the stover and fertilize the trees. This gentleman in Uganda is growing banana, coffee, and vanilla, and here is Europe's biggest agroforestry system. It actually goes around the pole in Canada, in the US, in Russia, and in Scandinavia. It is the reindeer herding systems in the Arctic taiga. Now, a lot of tropical farming, we tend to think of as being bad for the environment. And oil palm plantations come in for a particularly bad rap here. Well, here's our oil palm plantation. Yes, I promise you, there's oil palm in there. But there's also all sorts of other things in there. There's achai, there's coffee, there's cacao, there's timber trees, there's honey. And all of that increases the productivity of the system. This is probably the most productive agroforestry system I know. It's in Sumatra. It is so complex that if any of you walk straight through it, you'll think you're in a rainforest. No, you're in a working farm producing over 20 different value chains, including some extremely valuable industrial products like damar, a resin. People are imaginative. Here is an agroforestry system from Sri Lanka. The agroforestry component are the little trees in between the big coconuts. The coconuts are the crop. It fixes nitrogen, the leaves are left on the ground to fertilize the cocos, and the branches are coppiced and are burned for electricity in a nearby plant. And here is my favorite European landscape, the Montados. The best ham in the world and the corks that close the best champagne bottles in the world come from that landscape. And you also have mushrooms, you also have other crops that are happening there. This was a picture taken on the farm of a friend. He's also got cattle, he's got sheep, and he's got vegetables in there. You've all heard of Mount Kilimanjaro, but unless you've tried to climb it, you won't have seen this landscape, the so-called Shaga Gardens. At least four different stories, plus climbing wines like vanilla and black pepper. And here, in some of the driest countries on earth, in Niger, you find that the trees these little gray blobs, are essential to productivity. No trees, no food. It's as simple as that. Why? Because those trees are not only nitrogen fixing, but they have a reverse phenology. Unlike everything else in the desert, they lose their leaves when the rainy season comes and go into dormancy. So they don't compete with your crop. And those lovely little leaves, which are filled with nutrients, decompose at the soil surface and feed your crop seedlings, which you can see there, that's the green. It's also good for nutrition. Fruit for kids grows in these dark patches, which are the mango trees around the villages. So why? Why are there trees everywhere in farming systems that are not mechanized? Well, first, because trees have deep roots. They can pump nutrients up from way below the surface where your crop roots are not going to, or your, your, your sward is not going to get them. And these fall to the surface and become available to the crops thanks to leaf fall. They're also great at buff buffering water cycles. 
In dry areas, they will absorb rain and store it under the surface. In wet areas, if you choose the right species, they will help dry out your land if that's what you want. They are a much better way of managing incipient resources like sunlight. Now, in agroforestry, sometimes research takes a while. These, that line at the bottom, it says years. This is an experiment that's been running for 40 years. And it was done in France. And what these guys did is they planted a wheat field and they measured the amount of sunlight that the wheat field used, about 20, 25%. They planted a forest, a walnut forest, and they measured the amount of uh, sunlight that the walnut forest used, nothing at the beginning, and then about 55, 60% as the trees matured. And then they measured what happened when you mix the two together. And when you mix the two together, the first thing you notice is that over time, your wheat yield is going to go down. Of course, it's being crowded out by the trees. But if you look at the total productivity over the 40 years of the experiment, you notice that the black area, the area of sunlight that is wasted, is smaller in the agroforestry system than either in the forestry system or in the agricultural system. So trees and crops can collaborate. And sometimes the crops can also offer services for the trees. For example, by forcing tree roots to go much deeper than they would in a forest before they spread sideways. What does that mean? Well, it means that on the forestry system, on the left, most of the rootlets are close to the surface. That's depth, and that's a quantity of rootlets. Whereas in the agroforestry system, most roots are at depth. So when you have the drought, your forestry tree suffers. Your agroforestry tree just goes, ha ha, I don't care because its rootlets are protected by its greater depth. But the culture in which farming operates has completely forgotten this, to the degree that the big seed sellers are using pictures like this to hawk their products. Now, this is supposed to tell us what a wonderful productive field is. What I see is a large field in temperate Europe in July when sunlight is at its maximum and we still get a fair amount of rain and there's no photosynthesis. All those resources, all that sunlight, all that water is wasted. Whereas in this wheat system, at least, some photosynthesis continues until October when the walnuts will lose their leaves. And that's why what we call the land equivalency ratio in agroforestry is always higher than one. In this fictitious example, what you need, it's 1.4, which means that you need 0.8 hectares of agriculture, monocrop agriculture, and 0.6 hectares of forestry to achieve the same productivity as one hectare of agroforestry. Is that unrealistic? No, not particularly. Here is an example from, from the UK, um, and what they did here is they used to have two segregated systems. They had a short rotation plantation willow, that's the line at the top, and they got 8.3 oven dry tons per year on average. And they had organic wheat, that's the second line, and they got 5 tons per year on average. In the agroforestry system, they put 20% of their land under willow, and they got 3.35 oven dry tons for their willow. 80% was on the wheat, of which 13% was shaded because it was close to the trees, and 67% was in full sunlight. And that alone produced 5.1 tons more than the monocrop system, even though only 80% of the land was devoted to wheat. To calculate the land equivalency ratio, that's the calculation at the bottom, it's simple. You take the agroforestry yield of the crop, divided by the monocrop yield of the crop, and you add to that the agroforestry yield of the tree, and divide it by the monocrop yield of the tree. And the result here was 1.43. So 43% more productivity from a system that is completely mechanized and really easy to put in place. I mean, not doing this is leaving money on the table. Here is the land equivalency ratio for wheat systems in southwest France. They are on a 40-year rotation. The productivity is 1.4, 1.6, so 40 to 60 percent more productivity than if you do it separately. And it's like that everywhere in the world. Now, Mali, one of the poorest countries in the world, you intercrop your maize and your cowpea, and you end up with a land equivalency ratio of 1.47. Java in Indonesia, it's richer. Simply by planting your maize and your teak together, you get to a land equivalency ratio of 1.9, almost twice as much productivity than if you simply have a teak forest and a maize field next to it. And palm oil, this is our experiment. Um, the two green lines, the colors are really lousy on this thing. The two green lines <coughs> on the left are two forms of agroforestry system, and that's the productivity of the, uh, of the oil in the agroforestry system. The red line on the right is the productivity of the neighbor's monocrop system. 
So even though we are not yet counting the bananas, the chai, and all the rest of it, just the oil productivity is much, much higher than it was in the monocrop system. And here's perhaps the best example. On the left, you have a rubber plantation. It's monoclonal, so it's very susceptible to disease, so you need to spray a lot. On the right, you have a jungle rubber garden. It's not monoclonal. It's uh, very varied. It's got about 20 value chains. And here's how they compare. The plantation is easy for an oligarch to manage. 10,000 hectares, hire one manager, have him hire a bunch of slaves to spray the crap onto his trees, it'll be fine. The jungle uh, rubber gardens, the jungle damar gardens, three to five hectares, they're complex, and a farmer cannot really manage anything bigger than that. The income after costs for the monocrop, $800. For the damar garden, $3,000. Now make a calculation, $3,000 times five hectares, that's $15,000 in a poor country like Indonesia. That means a concrete house, a car in a driveway, and a satellite dish on the roof. That's real development. The value chains, much, much more resilience because you have 10, 15 different value chains. So if the price of rubber crashes, you don't care. You still got coffee, bananas, fish, rice, whatever. The biodiversity ratio, and that's particularly interest to you, um, in the plantation is only about 2% of the natural forest that used to be there. But in the agroforest, it's 60% of the forest that used to be there. Phytosanitation use, low. It's part of the reason why the income is so high. Social costs, low, because you're not working for the boss, you're working for yourself. And environmental costs, very, very low. So for all of these reasons, these systems are slowly but surely spreading around the world. And here's perhaps the best example. This part of southern Niger called Zinder grew no food in the 1980s when they had the massive famines. Why? Yeah, you get 800 millimeters of rain a year, but it comes in one rainy season that lasts about six weeks, and then you have 10 months of sunlight, sunlight and sunlight with daytime temperatures between 35 and 40 degrees. In that environment, good luck to grow anything. When you let the trees regrow, these are these famous Phytherbia albida trees again, then suddenly you're talking. You add fertility, you buffer the heat, you offer distributed shade when the sun is coming back. And as a result of that, the production of food there is now about half a million tons more than before. You know when these guys are happiest? When there's a drought. Because when there's a drought, they also have less of an income. But what they have left, they still make more than what they need to eat, and what they have left is worth so much more on the market. So as far as they're concerned, the trees save them. Now, many of you will be tenant farmers, or will have some land that is your own, and you will be renting some land that belongs to something else. But guess what? It can even work on tenant and land. This is an example from Cambridgeshire. And what the farmer there, Stephen Briggs, did is he had fruit trees, apples, in his wheat system. He did it mostly to reduce wind speeds. It's very windy over there. But of course, he's also collecting the fruit. And he's putting red fruits in between his apples. And he reckons, he's only just started, he reckons his land equivalency ratio will be 1.1, so 10% more productivity. Um, but of course, as this progresses, we'll see what happens in reality. But it's for all of these reasons, because trees and crops and animals interact so well, that all of the best systems, when the experts sit down and figure out what the best ways are of increasing productivity, resilience, and mitigation, all of the best systems are the ones that involve trees. And the final picture I'll leave you with is a before and after picture from this Bamileke cocoa farmer in Western Cameroon. On the left was his house before he went full on with agroforestry, and on the right is his house now that he's got lots of value chains. So for us, the yield gap lesson is absolutely clear. To get from the African yields, that's the blue line down there, to halfway decent yields, simple agroecology, remember to use the right trees at the right place, use the animals in the right way, will get you there. And advanced agroecology and some entrance, because you do need to add some fertility when some nutrients are absent, will get you all of the way back. And that's why the future belongs to small farmers. Now, I could have taken an image of a European small farmer, but I want to stress that it is in these environments that the future is being played out. Look at this data from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. What they did here is they measured the crop productivity of a number of crops in a number of countries across all of the farms growing that crop. And they divided these farms into four classes classified by size. The blue line is the 25% smallest farms. The purple line is the 25% biggest farms. In every country for every crop, the smallholder farmers are more efficient than the big farmers. Why? The big farmer sits in a tractor. He has to homogenize. The small farmer is like a gardener. He knows exactly what's happening on every square inch of his land and where he needs to intervene and how he needs to intervene. And by the way, if you think that's just an issue for poor countries, no. Same idea in the US. 
This is from the US Department of Agriculture. And they took it by median size category and they looked at average gross output and average net output. This is data from 1992. And as you can see, the bigger your farm is, the less money you make. So the way of making farming efficient is to ensure that small farmers have the tool to do their job. This, by the way, is also the way that East Asia developed. Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, China, they all broke up their big land holdings, gave small plots of land to smallholder farmers, and then provided them with advice. Not inputs, advice. In 1960, Taiwan spent 10% of its GDP on agricultural extension. At the time, it was poorer than Ghana. Now, of course, it's a developed country. And the reason why that works is because agroforestry is more complex than monocropping. All farmers in a given environment planting the same crop on the same type of soil will achieve roughly the same kind of yield in a monocrop system. In a polycropping system, in an agroforestry system, it depends on how you plant the trees, how you prune them, what species you choose, how much work you put in, etc., etc. So while the majority of farmers are going to find their productivity going up, there is going to be a non-negligible fraction of farmers who are going to get it wrong in one way or another and who are going to suffer. So this is why knowledge is so important. And that is why, of these two individuals, this is the man who has done more for African farming, despite not spending a single penny on African agricultural research, whereas this guy, of course, has spent tens of billions of dollars on African agricultural research. And the reason is simple. It's this. Small-scale farmers, farming as a business, is a closed Facebook group for Zambian smallholders. Up there, it says 321,000 members, and I took that picture in December. Down there, it says 393,000 members, and I took that picture in March. This means that these little, to oops, these little toys are now spreading in the landscape, and they're helping farmers to talk to one another, to trade, to give each other advice, to help each other succeed. <laughs> And, and, and now, even more surprising, the poorest country on earth. Yeah. Okay, trust me, the next slide is about the poorest country on earth. It's about Niger. Niger is a place where only 10% of women can read and write, only 25% of men can read. None of my taxi drivers in Niamey could read an address or read a map. But it has six ministries of education. And in that country, there is a helpline. I have no idea why it's stuck now. A phytosanitation helpline. You call in to get advice. Oh, right, forget it. A phytosanitation helpline. You call in to get advice about your, um, the, the bugs that are um, threatening your crop. There we go. There we have it. And when they started the service two years ago, almost all of the calls came in through mobile phones. And the conversation always went in the same way. Do you, hello. Is your service for real? Yes, yes, it's for real. We're really going to help you. Okay, I've got a problem with this particular bug. Stop. Do you have enough credit on your phone? Credit is expensive in Africa. People are poor. And so the conversations were slow. Now, the orange line, most of the calls are coming in through WhatsApp. And WhatsApp is great in a country in which nobody can read and write because you can send pictures. You can send pictures of the bug that's on your, uh, 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 on your tomato plants. You can get a picture of the product you have to buy to deal with it. You can send audio files that people can listen to when the communication is broken again and again about interventions. And so that is absolutely extraordinary. Both of these products are Facebook products, and both of these products are making a massive difference to her productivity. That is why she, ladies and gentlemen, is the future of precision agriculture, not a machine. So if you look at the way that we think of farming today, yeah, it works in terms of producing food. But that's about it. It needs a fair amount of inputs. It's pretty bad at using uh, free inputs like sunlight or water. And the landscape does not offer many other amenities. It doesn't offer a lot of timber. It doesn't offer, it's not particularly beautiful to walk in. There are not a lot of pollinizers. The future, however, can be win-win. Simply by adding trees intelligently to those landscapes, you're going to find that you use fewer inputs, that you're using, producing about the same amount of food, but also timber and other amenities. So, if that is true, how many of you here have heard of agroforestry before I turned up? All right, a fair amount, great. But if that is true, then can you tell me why most of the world's farming ministries think that this is the bee's knees? Because they've gone to third level. 
The what? Not the college. They've all been to college, that's what. They've that's exactly right. That's exactly right. They have been to colleges where they are taught in France, they're not taught agronomy anymore. They are taught phytotechnology, right? They are looking at the tiniest little component of farming, which is genetics, and then figuring out how to give that plant the perfect environment in a neutral substrate, which they don't even call soil, with the perfect fertilizer, the perfect herbicide, the perfect pesticide, etc., etc. And the reason for that is first because we have let silos dominate our world. This is the way the world is divided into its various usages and surface areas, deserts, wetlands, de uh, pasture and rangeland, cropland, etc. And so we have a Ministry of Agriculture, and over there we have a Ministry of Environment, and over there somewhere there's a Ministry of Forestry. But the real world, of course, looks like this. All these bits of the system interact with one another. The nutrients flow, the gases flow, the animals flow, and our systems are not designed to deal with that. So you as a farmer are facing the nightmare of dealing with the cap, which is agriculture, and then sometimes the, minister, the forestry people, which want something else, and then the environment people, which want something else again, and I'm surprised that you actually stand for it. Second, cultural. To most townies, this looks like a healthy field, but it's not. This is, it only looks like that for a few months of the year. The rest of the time, it's blowing dust in the winds. This looks like a bloody mess. But it's in Central America, and those multi-cropping systems have kept high population densities alive for centuries. So just imagine how much more you could do if you improved the genetics of those trees a little bit, if you improved the management a little bit of a traditional system that has proven itself. Then, perhaps the worst thing is modernity. We are so in love with modernity, all of us. And no, don't claim you don't play with your phone on the toilet, we all do. So, what did that mean? It means that organically grown cities, like Birmingham, this is a picture taken in the 1920s, where you have multi-usage, you have people living in the top stories, you have workshops and shops at the bottom stories, you have cars and pedestrian all mixed on the street, it's alive, was replaced by this. Now, what happens there? Lots of goodies. More social anomie, more depression, more murder, more drug use, more energy use. Less work. I mean, it's, it's just awful. But for 40 years, it dominated the spirit. And it dominated it everywhere. This is a Soviet... I, have a, I did some work in the former Soviet Union in the 1990s, and I have a collection of Soviet posters. And this is my favorite. This is a Soviet poster that extols the amazing power of Soviet agriculture. And what you see in the background is a fertilizer plant, and in, in the foreground is a line of red tractors with the proud words, one million tractors produced this year. It's about agriculture. There's not a bloody plant in that picture. So whether you were in the capitalist system or whether you were in the communist system, what was given to you was always the same. Nature doesn't matter. What matters is technology. If you have money, you can literally grow wheat in the desert. You can sink a borehole, you can pump up the water, you can put in pivots, you can use planes to fly in any nutrient you like, and you can use planes to fly out your production. It's all technology. The soil is just a substrate. And then, frankly, our business model sucks. The people who are selling you your seeds and your fertilizer, they're all making between 50 and 300 euros a year from every hectare of your land. It's a great business to be in. Whereas we, my business model mostly consists to go cap in hand to people like him and say, please fund us, because we don't know how to sell this. So it's a cash flow issue. People who are selling you stuff and getting a few hundred euros from you every hectare, every month of every year across the EU, they have massive cash flow. We, nothing. On, that means they have massive marketing power. Everywhere you go, you see their publicity. They have massive research power, massive number. You know, we have 550 scientists. I don't know how many people work for Syngenta, Yara, Pioneer, and all the others, but it must be in the tens of thousands. And these are good scientists. They are blinkered, but they are good scientists. And then we have no political influence, very little. I mean, with all due respect, Mike, you're an independent MEP. You're not Manfred Weber, the leader of the most powerful political party in the European Parliament. Okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and then farming more and more looks like this. She's very happy because she just figured out how to squeeze another 8% productivity from the land investment her boss has made. 
And her play is over 10 years, and she doesn't give a fuck if after 10 years what she leaves behind is a radioactive wasteland. Her job is to make money over the 10 years that the investment is running. And more and more of that kind of farming is happening as well. So, at least our marketing should be great, right? Nah. They call that conventional agriculture. I have no clue what's conventional about this. It didn't exist 70 years ago. Even traditional agriculture. There's nothing traditional about this at all. But we, oh, we have lots of gurus, and every guru has his own little word. It always means the same thing. It means exploit ecosystem services, think before you spray and add some trees. But I collect these words, and I'm very happy today, sorry, that I picked up a new one. HNV farming. Didn't know about this one before. It, again, it means the same thing. It means respect ecosystem services, use them wisely, exploit them for your financial benefit. It's exactly the same as all the others. And, and there's, there's some real goodies on there. I really like farming God's way. That's from Zimbabwe. <laughs> so, also, we don't do aspiration very well. Our brochures, it's like this. This is a picture from Rwanda. And the message it sends out is, if you plant trees, you're going to carry a heavy load on your head with a <laughs> smile on your face. But this is aspirational. You show this picture to an African farmer, he, right, I get it. You then tell them that this is technology that was imported from Africa to Europe, and you can see them swell with pride. Finally, all, what all of that means is, I told you that there were one slide you had to remember. It's a tree stupid, the one at the beginning. But there's also this one. It's always remember the keystone species in a farming system. And it's always the same, it's us. Thank you very much. Uh, well done, uh, Patrick. And uh, the one line that I'll take out of what you said there, and it's probably the most important line, because if it isn't the most important line, that was irrelevant. You said it's like that everywhere in the world, as in when you were talking about increased productivity. And what I want to try and explore, and hopefully we can explore, is through working with yourself and working with someone else, that we, as I've said earlier, there is a midterm review of the forestry strategy, that we apply this logic and this science and these ideas into a new midterm review because as i've said originally no one came in here and said oh forestry is bad no forestry is good you're all more nuanced than that and we see it here there's good forms of forestry and we look out the window here not too far and you see very bad forms of forestry so what i hope to get out of this is that we can produce something that we can then present maybe in four, five, six weeks' time, present it to uh, DG Agriculture, present it to DG Envy, go to uh, the Department of Agriculture and present it to them. And it's all very well saying, well, there is a better way, but to produce a document that shows there is a better way would be a very, very good start. Now, no one is saying there are any silver bullets. There are never any silver bullets, but there's definitely a better way. And when I said I hear an awful lot of stuff and you'd end up depressed after listening to it about farming, I don't think you'd be depressed after listening to that. It might not have been the fields in Leitrim, but it showed you. Like if you have a situation where farmers in Indonesia are getting 3,000 euros profit per hectare, it's one of these things you hear and you go, I had to have heard it wrong. And then you hear there are farmers in Leitrim earning 3,000. Now, I'd say it's not the most expensive place in the world to buy a house or anything like that, Leitrim. But I'd say it's a bit more expensive than living in Indonesia. And if it can be done there, it can be done here. How it's done, you could put up your hand now and ask me, how is it done? And I'll be blank. I don't know exactly. But we have the start of something here to try and find out. So, look, at, I'll shut up now. And uh, I'm going to throw the floor open to questions. You don't want to be here all night, I presume. So we'll do it for maybe a half an hour of, of questions. And you can ask any one of us uh, a question. You're probably better off asking them questions because they'll give you a better answer. But whatever you want to ask. So uh, John will go around with the mic there and uh, stand up and point your question to the particular person if you have a particular question.
thank you and thank you for speak most most uh, to hear this completely new. I'm Liam Breslin and Good Energies uh, in Leitrim. Uh, and you talked about tools and so on. Uh, the land mentioned twice. Um, just to let you know, it doesn't touch Leitrim that much. And we're going to have shortly the Bera Brefni Way, which will go all the way from the very south of the country and allow us to exploit the tourism and show off this, this natural value that we have. But today you, you've all been touring uh, throughout Leitrim and I, I didn't hear mention of two things that are of interest to us, two natural things. Uh, you both had a bit of the wind and a bit of the sun. And what we're hoping for is a campaign that would actually uh, allow people in this whole region to produce um, microelectricity, microgeneration developed by themselves, and perhaps exported, and that would have the effect of avoiding sending money to Bahrain and also gaining money from sending some something to Dublin. So I was wondering if you had any comments on that. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle it uh, at first. Uh, I, I agree with the whole idea of going down the road of photovoltaic cells and looking at the whole area of solar power. And one of the things that drove that for me was we had a meeting with the Professor Tim Searchinger from Princeton University, and he was talking to us about biomass and uh, the futility of actually planting purely for biomass and the benefits of photovoltaic cells uh, in comparison to it. And the figures that he had, to me, they were extraordinary. He's a professor in Princeton. His game is climate change. His game is energy production. And he estimates that even by today's photovoltaic average standards of what's produced, and there's better and there's worse, but he said by the average production of photovoltaic cells at the moment, he said you would get more energy out of one hectare, let's say you had 100 hectares of forestry planted, you would get more energy out of one hectare over the lifetime of that forestry in photovoltaic cells than you would out of burning the whole 100 hectares. So the idea of going down the road of photovoltaic cells, the idea of going down the road of wind power that's owned by the local people and they get to use it and they get the dividend out of it. If people want that, I support that. I think it makes sense because I was talking about it earlier today. People, I get attacked and turf gutters get put down for cutting turf and they get put down for, for reasons of climate change. It's damaging the climate and it's putting more carbon into the atmosphere. And listen, I listen to all of those arguments. But I also look at the other side of it, which is, at the moment, my father goes out he gets his turf cut locally, he saves it locally, the money stays locally, the money stays with the local turf cutter, and we get all of that benefit out of it. And I think the only day, the day that photovoltaic cells, the day that anaerobic digestion as well, the day that wind power actually gets the support of the people is when the people get the dividend out of it. Because we're being asked to move away from something we use now that gives us money locally to something that's more sustainable is going to save the planet. But means we don't have any money out of it, we don't have any existence out of it, and we've less reason to live around here. So I support the idea of micro-generation. Um, uh, we need to get the government to support it, obviously, because it makes sense. And it's for every euro that we produce, it's a euro less we need to bring in from the outside. So maybe... And, and if you're going to put solar panels, please add some vegetables between them. The land equivalency ratio there is about 1.3 to 1.7. That was work that was done in France. Yeah. And you can graze the sheep between them. Sure. There you go. Does, does that, any, any of the rest of you want to deal with that point? Or we'll, we'll go on to another question then. Um, Michael McManus, um, Leitrim Organic Farmers, um, farmers and growers, I should say. Again, my question is, more uh, addressed to the Tagus rec representative here. Um, it was really fantastic what you put up there. I think it's the first time I've ever heard anything like that coming from Tagus. 
that there is that kind of un an understanding of farming within Tagus um, from a social, socio-economic platform. But one of the questions, I suppose, that I have always been asked is, uh, why don't you get a proper job? I've been asked that from, I was a child, believe it or not. And that says quite, quite a lot of the view we have in Ireland of agriculture. Um, I'd also want you to uh, comment on, I remember our farm where we had a mix of um, dairy cattle and sucklers and so on. And I have to say I'd agree it was much more productive than it is now. There was a sort of a, a tendency to go down the route that you had to be one or the other. And I just make the comparison of efficiency and I won't tell the big long story, but I was talking to a vet um, only two days ago who, who did her thesis or so on um, in America, or, or I think it was maybe Canada. And uh, she explained to me they were very efficient. They had large herds. Uh, the cattle were on antibiotics from the day they were born until the day they finished with them. If they died, well, they were just hauled down the field and left there. Um, it was a really efficient system, food production system. <coughs> but we're not going to compete with that, and I wouldn't like to see us, and I certainly wouldn't want to be a farmer doing something like that. But that's what we are faced with if we want to go down that route. And that has to be wrong. I'd like you just to comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your comment. Um, I suppose just like Patrick's conversation about the agility and diversity of these farming systems when different species are combined in, in either following scientific advice, but also I, I've seen these types of systems maybe historically and in the post-socialist context as, wel as well that come from tradition, um, driven not only by maybe wisdom as to how to cultivate or rear different animals together, but also um, a, a rel a, an intention and a desire to be to be self-sufficient and to be secure in one's own family and within a community. And I think it was kind of the farming community were were told not to pursue that 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 was kind of backward and you should really try and become more efficient in a larger scale. And there are interesting studies in Canada um, that they call it milking anami, and you mentioned the, the term so social anami, and you know essentially that once the relationship between the farmer and the herds is broken. I mean, I've interviewed lots of large dairy farmers in Ireland, and it's very interesting that um, they might not have names for the, the cows anymore, but they know all their tag numbers and they know their behaviours. Not just the farmer now, all the children, the wife. They still have that relationship, a very, very close relationship with their herds. But studies have shown internationally that there is a certain tipping point once the herd gets us over a certain size, that goes. There also, just what you mentioned, the sociological studies, there's an acceptance of mortality. Um, you know, and you know, the event of an animal dying on a farm is highly traumatic for a farmer. Um, but th that there's that distance. So I, I agree. I, I don't know what else to say. Only to say that I agree with you. Yeah. Any any of the other two want to say anything about that, or we move on to another question? Do you want to talk, Patrick? No. Um, well, and if anyone wants to make a statement as well, do we? It is much right to make a statement as any as us. So it doesn't have to be a question. Can I just add one thing to that, if you don't mind, yeah. because just somebody here reminds me of it: the Heritage Fishing Bill. And I think that's another. Um, very, very important policy development. And I would like to see a heritage farming bill. Yeah. And it's all about that relationship. Coastal fishermen, the relationship and care they take of the inland waters, their knowledge of it, of every inch of the, of the area beneath the sea and uh, near to there, that's all handed down as well. And I've seen, you know, the care they take of, you know, the V-notching, that's a very popular scheme. Um, they re very readily engage in it so that the female lobsters aren't, you know, they notch them and put them back. And they have this, this, this kind of care 
uh, towards their environment, but also, you know, stocks. And I think that should be equally acknowledged and, and preserved and respected. Just to mention that. There, there's your push, Martin. Now, a heritage farm, a farming bill. So, uh, very good. Uh, it makes it makes it makes an awful lot of sense. And I always remember watching Glen Row years ago, and it was all a big joke. Dinny went out and he bought the five dozen eggs, and he dipped them in cow shit, and he went off and he sold them to everyone at double the price, and people were laughing. Well, 58% of the egg market in the UK now is free range. People walk into a shop and they go. That's more expensive than that. But I'm making a choice. More than half, nearly 60% of the people, nearly two-thirds of them, are going, I prefer the way that's produced. And we can do that with other products. People don't have a particular thing with eggs that they want them to be special. They just like to know that the food is produced in the best possible way. I think we do it already. It's just we don't have the label on it or we don't seem to be entitled to a label. So there is more potential to make a living of that type of farming as well because people like me are more likely to buy that type of food because when I walk into a supermarket I have more than one job not just to feed myself I've also got to make sure well I put it like little go on about a living wage and Aldi go on about a living wage living wage for the people who are working there what about a living wage for the people who produce the, pro the produce in the first place and I think the best way to do that is this added value, this extra brilliant product, call it free range eggs, call it heritage, call it what you want. Well, what they actually call it in the UK now is woodland eggs. And that's the fastest growing segment of the organic egg market in the UK. And it is a little bit of an additional income for the farmers. And the advantage for the farmer of having woodland with his chicken shed is that the chickens will actually leave the shed and go out into that woodland when they tend to congregate around the doors in an open shed because of the ancestral fear of raptors. So that's obviously not the story that's sold to the customer, but the customer sees a beautiful picture of a woodland with little chickens running around inside it and is ready to pay a premium. And this is the fastest growing egg market in the UK at the moment. So, another question? Sorry. Um, uh, Vincent Harrington is my name, and I think this is a great meeting now, and, it's, and, it's, and before the talks in Europe. But there's a question I'd like to ask about the forestry all over Ireland. As a scientific question, I want to know if you plant a rake of trees, like in Leitrim, with a lot of Leitrim, was there ever a scientific test done with the mortars and that's just so on? Will, that, will them trees affect the climate? They have to get water to survive as they are growing. So if they are growing, they want water to survive. So they have, to, they have the strength, the earth has the strength to pull it out of the sky as the same as anything else in the world. It's, it's all a part of the world. Very simple thing. And if you plant big majority of trees like that, is it taking effect? And that's the why maybe we're having such a bad weather in Ireland because there's a fair amount of it the last 30 years. And the second question is, everywhere you go, I'm asked, oh, why do you work so hard for what's out of it? Because the simple answer is, I love it. And they say, why do you not go and plant it and you get all this money? But I don't say, why plant it? There's no future in it. Plant 60 acres, where's the future? And what's more, when, when farmers bought into crops and merts for a, a place to sell their cattle, why do these people that's not planting acres and acres of forestry and that has only drawn it for grants, planting it for grants, why are they not made paid into a cooperative for the factory me, uh, you were probably in, in, in the Roscommon County Council when it was sold a bit of land, I would say a boy made four, four million. There is nothing on it today, not a thing. That fact that if there's so much about trees in the west of Ireland, why not develop that ground as a factory? And that if, it, that put, if you give 100,000 for a farmer land, you put in 10,000 that there's somewhere to, to harvest your crop out and let it be so dust for China, or let it be fully finished floor for Africa. That's, 
that's what I would call business, that's good business being done. But it's gone that individual sawmills buy the timber or whatever they want and they get rid of it as quick as they want for a quick profit. But there's nothing going back into the environment. So they should be made pay because they're drawing big money and all the ones is the suspects and they're gone. Thank you very much. Um, I, I discovered something today and it was that uh, I didn't turn up as a chancer not knowing what the carbon sequestration potential for uh, marginal land was, uh, high ra raised bog, uh, for Sitka spruce, etc. And I have figures, estimates, 45 tonnes per hectare for uh, raised bog, figures of 12 tonnes per hectare for Sitka spruce. But I found out today that uh, it's not only me who isn't definite about this, we don't have a lot of accurate figures on that. As in, we don't definitely know. There is ways to find it out. We can set up measuring stations and we should, most likely, we should be doing that because it's very hard to make it. It's like driving around in a car with no speedometer on it. You can have an idea of how fast you're going, but really, you don't really know. So. Okay, we, we, we have a very good idea that it doesn't make sense from a carbon sequestration point of view to plant Sitka spruce on raised bog. But we need more detail on that. We, know, we need those figures done because we don't have a way of actually definitely saying whether it's good or bad. But we do know from science that it, it does sequester an awful lot of carbon, this wetland, but we need to find out the exact figures. Maybe uh, someone can tell us, are they going to do this? Or maybe James, I was James Moran, maybe he might want to talk to it. But uh, anyone here want to say anything about it? Any of the three? Well, I don't have uh, the figures myself, but I mean all the science we know does tell us that pit bogs sequester is one of the extreme sequesters, sequestering systems of carbon. So I would bet that if you want to use trees to increase carbon storage, you really need to take first the right trees in the right place. The right place is not over a peatland, I would say. But um, I would also wish to comment on what you said, uh, Luke, uh, on the issue of biomass. Yeah, versus other forms of renewables. Um, all forms of energy that we are available, except from nuclear energy, come from, come from the sun, including oil and coal. It just takes a millions of years of accumulating that sun, and then we, we use it too quickly. So that's not really renewable. When you come to, to this, the photovoltaic, you capture the sun that comes daily, and you can capture it for yourself, as you said, uh, keeping the value there. If you use um, wood for bioenergy, well, of course, you can get that back, that CO2 back, but it will take some decades, depending on, on the species. And especially what I wanted also to say, oh, you can't, have, you can't have the cake and eat it. If you want to count with the carbon storage in the trees, so you better leave the trees there, or at least when you cut the wood, you keep it as wood. If you use it for bioenergy, off it goes again to the atmosphere. So, so this is an important debate on renewables, and I pretty much would favor that you should keep the value of renewables uh, locally. All right, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Luke. And, uh, Martin Kenny, I'm a TD locally here, and uh, just to, to thank Luke and, and the contributors tonight for you know an excellent presentations on. on uh, I suppose what, what we generally term and what farmers get paid for is lands of natural constraint. That's what this part of the world would be would be considered. And uh, I know Anya recognised me from I have I have a bill going through the doll at the moment or trying to get through the doll. We're doing pre legislative scrutiny on it called the Island Heritage Bill. And it's it's interesting the link because it is quite similar. What we done was we have a bill which would for fishermen living on the off the offshore islands of Ireland that they would get a special access to a special piece of quota so that they could traditionally fish in the artisan traditional way that they fished for to make a livelihood. Because unfortunately they can't compete for to get fish quota under the common fishery policy with the big guys that are in the game. And it's, it's very similar when you come here to farmers on the lands of natural constraint. Because the farmers here that get their single farm payment or their, their, their uh, entitlements as we call it now, they're based on 
the activity they done in 2000, 2001, and 2002. And most of them are low-intensity farmers. So their productivity was considered to be low, so therefore their payments were low. And in actual fact, the scheme is designed more for farmers of that nature than for the big intensive farmers. But it was the big intensive farmers that got the larger payments. So, you know, there's an injustice in that that we'd hope that the common agricultural policy as we move forward would, would try and, and resolve. Um, I was very interested as well in, in, in the whole debate around uh, agroforestry and, and, and what, what possible um, benefits it can bring about. Because I was only talking to a guy actually from Leitrim County Council there a couple of weeks ago, and it was about a man looking to get planning permission. And you can't get planning permission in Leitrim if the soil is too dense because you won't get past the T-test. And he complained that the, the, what we call the, the, the percolation test was carried out too near the ditch because the roots of the trees in that part of the soil open up the soil and allow it to be more absorbent. And in other words, it improves the soil quality. They wanted it further out in the field where the soil would be worse. So it, it, there's, a, there's a reverse story to that. The reverse story to that is that the root network of the trees or the, or the, or the hedgerow helps the soil quality. So that's, that's just, just something that reminded me of that when, when you were saying about it. Um, the problem I suppose we have in this part of the world, and, and the, the, the person that asked about silky spruce, we've looked at silky spruce, and it's a model of forestry which is not about carbon sequestration. It's a model of forestry which is about the timber industry. Okay? You grow a large number of trees very close together, very dense, planted very densely. They grow up very fast. When they get up, uh, I suppose, after the first 10 to 15 years, they're very close together. There's very little foliage on them because the foliage is all at the top, I suppose, quarter of the tree. When you walk into that forest, the ground is bare under it, and there's no foliage all the way up the tree until you get to the very top. So there's very little of the, of the needles actually absorbing carbon because there's very few needles there. And needles are said to be up to 25% less efficient at absorbing carbon than broad leaves anyway. So that's, that's two things you have. Then you have no undergrowth. So there's no undergrowth absorbing carbon either. The needles are when we call them evergreen trees. They're not evergreen. The needles fall and replace automatically as they fall. But the needles are quite toxic to the soil underneath. So that there's, there's another problem there. Then they go in and they thin out the trees after about 15 years. And the thinnings are taken away. And 90% of the time, the thinnings are used for chipping and are burnt. Or else they're used in, in, in some kind of hardwood or processed timber. But a lot of it is actually burnt. So that carbon is released straight back into the atmosphere again. Then about 15 years later, they're given another tenon. And again, there's quite a large proportion of that tenon, which is used for wood chipping. And then finally, they're clear felled. So the whole lot is cleared away altogether. And when they're cleared away altogether, of, of the good timber that's left, the timber that goes into, I suppose, roofing for houses and things like that, is probably, of, of that size of timber, is probably maybe 60 to 70%. But you have maybe 40% of that timber, which again goes to chipping and is burnt. So a large proportion of the carbon that's sequestrated by the, by the silky spruce forestry is actually released back into the atmosphere over the lifetime of the forest. So not only is it very inefficient at absorbing the carbon in the first place, it's put back into it afterwards. So it, it is a very inefficient model and a very poor use of government money. And we pay a large amount of grants to farmers for to plant the land under, the, con under the, the, the concept that that is to sacrosanct carbon. But that's why we're doing it. That's why the farmers have been paid. But the actual model of forestry they're doing is very poor at, at, at performing that. So there, there, is, there is a problem here that somehow or other we need to look at. You also have the social impact of it, and we've debated that before, where when, and, and it goes back to the, the point that Anya was making about how farmers, the relationship with the land. When most farmers plant their land, they don't consider themselves farmers anymore. They've broken that. that f it is a permanent change of land use. The land is gone. And not only does that farmer not consider it to be uh, a farming anymore, none of their neighbours consider it farming anymore. Society doesn't consider it farming anymore. You know, and, and that's, I suppose, the, the difference. And it was very interesting to see the, the stuff there with the, the uh, was it, I think, um, uh, walnut trees and, 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 and other, other crops growing on them. And all the, now, one of the problems we have here, and the reason why silky spruce is pushed so much in this part of the world is it's marginal land. The soil depth is a couple of inches. Silky spruce grows with a big, broad root on the top of the soil. It doesn't go deep, and it can't go deep because we don't have the quality of soil to let deep-rooted trees grow. 
So if we're looking at trying to find a solution which is going to be about agroforestry, we need to, to come up with particular models of crop that will work or models of trees that will work in the particular type of soil that we've got. And, and, and not only for the trees that will grow, but also for the other crops that will grow under them. Because believe me, you won't grow grain anywhere in Nitro. <laughs> and, and every farmer here knows that. You know. And uh, the, the other interesting one was the, the, the issue of, of uh, it, was, it was mentioned I think by Liam, about the, the, the photovoltaic cells and, and, and using solar power. We, I've seen solar farms that are used like that. And what happens is the farmers, usually the land in England, I've seen it where they lease the land, and they put this photovoltaic far, uh, uh, solar panels on it, probably about 25 to 30 acres, they say it has to be, to be viable. They lease the land from the farmer, but they allow the farmer to go back in and graze their sheep under it, because they need something to eat the gra grass under it to grow up through the photovoltaic cells. So, you know, th there are options there, but all of these options require uh, thinking outside the box. And the big thing, I think, in all of this is and, and it was mentioned by Anya as well, is the relationship between the consumer on one end and the producer on the other. The consumer, and, and we always say, and I've heard it all over the place in, in every agriculture committee we have in, in Dublin, we talk about, you know, that we are such great farmers in Ireland and we produce the cleanest and the best of beef and it's grass-fed and it's free-roaming and it's traceable. And all those are true and are, are in general. Now, there's a couple of holes in that, that that people don't want to look at and we have to start looking at. First of all, we have an Origin Green label. Origin Green should say that everything is, is coming from Ireland, that it is all Irish product. But an awful lot of the, of the inputs that we put into our beef and our dairy are actually imported grains, and a lot of it is genetically modified. And that's a problem we've got. So, you know, we need, to, we, need to, we need to look at that. And there's, there's an opportunity there, I think, for our grain industry as well for to be able to, to do something about that. Because we really have to accept that if, if Ireland is going to change the way we move forward as an agricultural country, we have to be niche marketing. We have to be taking stuff that we are niche marketing now and mainstreaming it and saying we have the best food in the world, but we have to be able to stand over that. There's no point in saying we have the best beef in the world if we're bringing in corn gluten from somewhere which is genetically modified and pretending that everything is okay. Or if, they're putting, if somebody somewhere is putting, is putting, is putting a, a thousand head of cattle in a shed and pumping them and pretending that it's okay. It's not okay. That will not work. Ultimately, the only way we can solve this problem is if we are genuine about it, but that means that the farmer has to get a good price. And the farmer won't get a good price as long as it's dominated by the big processors. And that's the other problem we've got. And that goes back to the point that you said at the beginning, Duke, about you know, the opportunity with producer organizations. Horace Plunkett 100 years ago set up the co-ops in Ireland. Before that, farmers were on their knees. The cooperative model worked extremely well. And what happened is, like everything that gets too big, somebody at the top of it, usually the managers of it, decide, well, you know, this is making an awful lot of money, we need to, to float this on the stock exchange. And when they do that, where it ends up, it ends up that it becomes a conglomerate that nobody can work with anymore. And it gets too big and the farmers suffer. So we need to go back to the model of the small farmer-owned cooperatives so that can market their produce directly and can, can come to a situation where the farmer gets a proper price for their product. Because that's the big thing that's missing. Farmers are not getting the price that they deserve for the work that they put in. The farmer takes all the risk. They're the one that gets up in the middle of the night, make sure the cow calves, make sure the lamb is looked after. They, look, they, they do all the work. And all these guys in the middle then make all the money. And the consumer at the other end is told they have to pay a high price because it's such a quality product. The only reason they have to pay such a high price is because there's so, so much greed in the center of the whole lot. And we need to find a way of working that out. Um, there was just, there was just another, another point I, I wanted to make, and that's around the, the, the notion of um, uh, the traditional farming. And, and I agree, you know, and, and interestingly, we had a debate in the Dáil there a couple of weeks ago, and, and it was actually, uh, Matty McGrath talked about out, uh, tin and beat and doing all this hard work, and it was great when you were young and really hard. Like, we, we, we don't want to go back to the stage where, where, people, where farmers are, are getting up at six o'clock in the morning and working day and night, and you know, the, technology and, and, and automation and all of these things are good and help, and should help the farmer to be, not only to be more productive, but to be wealthier. But you see, what it's done is it made the farmer more productive and less wealthy. So we do need, to, we do need to, to turn this thing around. And I, I believe absolutely that we can turn it around. I don't buy into this notion that, you know, it's all lost. 
that the big guys can control everything and that we can't, we can't turn it around. We can turn it around, but we have to work together to do it. And it isn't going to be easy because there's too much profit in it for the guys in the middle. But we, we can turn this around. And the opportunity that Ireland as an island nation has for to market its produce, all of its produce on the world market, as being clean, green, all the good stuff. But we have to be very genuine. And the problem is the people in the middle are letting that slip. And we want to be very, very careful around that. So I leave it at that. And again, just to congratulate Luke and, and, and thank all the contributors here this evening. Thank you. Just one thing uh, about what you said there, and that is, that, uh, and we know this, and Anya, you've, you've said that farmers won't necessarily just go there because there's money in it, but, or because there's money thrown at it. But the message at the moment is, if you go into agroforestry, they'll give you a grant for five years. If you go into the other type of forestry, they'll give you a grant for 15 years. So basically, they're telling you you're, a, whatever, if you go into agroforestry, you're an idiot, don't do it, keep away from it, and we'll give you three times the amount to go into the other area. And it's a lever that's been pulled and sending people in the wrong direction. It's not going to change everyone, but if there was more of an incentive to go into agroforestry than there was to go into the other type of forestry, it is obviously more likely if the farmer can buy into it, that they'll do it. So there was, there was a change in the differential between uh, the planting of broadleaf and planting of conifers, but it was insignificant and it wasn't enough uh, because they take a lot longer to grow, etc. so that should be taken into account. But I'm not some kind of genius here that worked that out. They can work that out as well. They can go, okay, if I give a longer term grant for agroforestry, they'll be more likely to go into it. They're not doing that. So obviously they don't want us to do that. Uh, they could give us more for planting broadleaf. They know that'll mean more people will do it. They're not doing that. So it is the official policy that they don't want us to do it. So, you know, it's not that complicated really. If they want us to do it, they'd incentivize us to do it. And that isn't definitely going to make you do it, but it's going to make it more likely you will. So uh, yet again, uh, as Martin says, these aren't all unsolvable. They are, there are solutions to it. And back again to 3,000 euro per hectare in Indonesia. Um, uh, oh God, but what is it? $3,000, okay. And there was a time in Ireland when you said it was dollars, people would get more excited. So $3,000. You had something to say there, Patrick, about that, did you? I couldn't agree more with everything that you said. And I will add two things. First, food is too cheap. It's too cheap around the world. It's always too cheap. And it's too cheap at the farm gate, and it's too cheap in the supermarkets. People have forgotten what food is and how it needs to be produced. And yes, you need to ensure that the poor can afford to buy food, but for that you need targeted supply measures. You don't necessarily need to pay the whole food cheap. Second, I love this idea of trying to reserve a quota for small artisanal fishermen in the outer islands. And if you can figure out a way of reserving a quota for small farmers to protect them against these winds of business, that would go a long way towards helping you maintain the quality of the island brand in the um, uh, 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 international food markets. Um, the fact that the middlemen and the corporations are gathering all the money, that is the way of the world. They can afford better lawyers than you and I can. They can afford more scientists than you and I can. They can buy more advertising, more lobbyists. Oh, and believe me, they're lobbyists. They're good looking, they're clever, they have beautiful words, and they take you to the best restaurants. I mean, you know, it's difficult to resist that kind of inducement. So the, the, the important thing here is to remember the crucial thing that you said. When communities organize themselves, then communities are strong. When small farmers are organized in a community, then they can beat the big boys. If they then fall for the seducing words of the lobbyists for the banks and corporatize themselves, then it's not a community-based organization anymore. You need to create a new one. It's as simple as that. The last point I would want to make is you are part of Europe now. And unlike your neighbors to the north, you will remain part of Europe. That means that doing this in Ireland is great, but doing it together with the other member states is so much more important. And there are some member states that get it more, but frankly, most don't quite get it. So support him in Brussels. Ensure that your government, when it goes to council, is talking agroforestry all the time. 
Final point on the biophysics. I've seen the land here today and I was shocked. I have an artificial leg and it sucked my prosthesis almost off. You know, <laughs> you sink into that. I, 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 have, I have mud up to my knees, practically up to my gro groin to prove that I've seen <laughs> what an Irish farm looks like. So I will confess I have no clue what kind of agroforestry system would work here. I'm really not a specialist in these kind of landscapes, which are very special, but we can certainly identify the people who are oh, to begin to develop land use systems. Here. Sorry? Perhaps you could do a pilot scheme here. Uh, yeah, but if I don't know what I'm doing, the pilot scheme is going to be guaranteed to fail, and that's not necessarily what we want, is it? Who do know I do know people who do. But this is special. I mean, you know, the ground that sucks your prosthesis off you, that's, that's special. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's going to be difficult to figure out what to do here. But maybe, you know, but, but there, may, maybe you, you, you have a director here from DG Environment, so these guys are in touch with more research on these issues than practically anybody else, um, us included. So maybe you have some you can land interesting the ideas. No. <laughs> I'll share you my two or three interesting ideas from everything I've listened. I also don't have civil bullets to solve everything. But while I was listening to you and while small farmers are not taken into account adequately or those in areas of natural constraints, well, it just happens that often it's the small farmers in areas of natural constraints that are delivering what we from with the environment hat want. But, you know, in many countries you don't find the same minister responsible by one side by nature and also for the agricultural funds. And that's a bit of a problem that we can addru address through the common yeah, agriculture Austria, policy. Yeah. But even in some countries, the example uh, of Spain and Portugal, the which I belong, even when the two subjects are joined, are joined, that usually means the environment is sidelined and this still remains as the, as the usual approach on agriculture. But what I wanted to highlight on this is if the, common, the future common agriculture policy would have to have its environmental objectives fully aligned with environmental policy and regulation and targets, and the results measured through what's achieved under the environmental angle, the ministers are forced to dialogue and to get it better. And maybe that can help a bit to have it uh, on the right side. On the issue of the discussion on Sitka spruce, etc. Uh, et well, I can give you one parallel for my country. I'm from Portugal. You've seen we had 100 people burned in forest fires this in the summer, and that's a consequence of monocultures, not those that are actually managed by industry. If we have industry, pulp industry managing, they have the resources, they own a fire brigade, etc., and they can be pretty efficient in avoiding it. But on these margin, margin lands, when producers just have planted eucalyptus and pines and, and shrubs, there's no herbivores any, any longer, and there's climate change, it just, just burns like hell when you get more than 30 degrees less of temperature, less than 30% of humidity, and, uh, and um, high winds. So this is just to tell you, in those cases now, that monoculture which was devised for wood is not even delivering wood. But what we must keep in, uh, in mind is, it's of course um, valid to have, have as a goal timber production. We have seen this factory today that relies on Sitka spruce. But of course you will lose a lot of ecosystem services that you can't get through a monoculture, but you can get through these mixed approaches of agroforestry. So my, my final comment is, usually I follow nature conservation for long. That usual approach, usual message was, well, uh, we have the panda or the tiger or, uh, or the blue whale, so we should not do this and that. That was the usual message, restriction, don't do. There's now a new message, and the message is, well, we humans are facing quite some problems, aren't we? Well, many of the solutions are nature-based solutions that we can bring back, maybe add with a bit of technology and more knowledge you have today, and that delivers. And it happens that this approach sounds nicely to a lot of the consumers that actually would like to have something more natural in their food or in the way they dress or whatever. So this is the avenue that we should exploit more, and I think agroecology and agroforestry will indeed be keywords for that. Thank you. Uh, All right. My name is Bridget Murphy. I'm from the Irish Naturian Hill Farmers Association. Patrick, I'd like to thank you for showing some of your slides that, that, that showed that food is produced in more places than just the first world. As a matter of fact, 70% of the food is produced on relatively small amounts of land globally. 
But unfortunately, that land is under attack. Um, it's shrinking rapidly, and it's shrinking because of corporate movement into it. We know the worlds of Monsanto. We know, the, the, as you say, the lobbying power, the agenda of the fertilizer companies, the seed companies, the herbicide companies, etc. So on one level, straight away, we do have this massive threat. Well, at least what we are saying here presents a massive threat to their agenda, and it's certainly going to, to, to be challenged. But um, Martin and, and, and you perhaps did start alluding to the fact that the way to get around this is, is for the ground to start developing a vision itself and for people to, to, to actually start coming together around a different way of feeding the world. And I suppose that was what I was wanting to touch on. It's something that we need to start developing in Ireland, communities starting to develop a picture of what they see their future could start looking like, one that would be different, one that's not about big tractors, big machinery, and, and, a, and a corporate move. Thanks. I'd like to react to that. Um, I actually disagree. These, uh, these big companies, yes, they are profit-maximizing monsters. But within these profit-maximizing companies, there are thousands of really good people who understand exactly what's wrong, for example, with African agriculture. Uh, for example, we've worked together with Syngenta in Zambia because uh, Syngenta is interested in distributing more seeds. But Zambian farmers are so poor, they can't afford to buy their product. So Syngenta is distributing seeds of this Phytherbia albida tree and using its private extension service to teach farmers how to grow the seedlings, how to plant them out, how to prune them in order to improve the fertility of their land so that the initial boost in fertility is achieved. Because they know full well that once the farmers have a little bit of money in their pocket, they will first pay the school fees and the school uniforms for the kids, and then they will invest in their farm. And that will mean better seeds and better fertilizers and God knows what else. So you can work with these people. What you often find is that people who are not involved in Africa, but who are the donors or who are the decision makers in the rich world and who don't know how African farmers operate, are putting too much faith in that technology. It's not bad technology. Improved, you know, an improved breed of maize is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Um, but they don't understand that it's actually an irrelevant thing in a context in which soil fertility is so very low. Great seeds and great fertilizer are fantastic things, but they're not going to create your topsoil for you. They're not going to create the infrastructure in order to come into the landscape for you. So you've got to work in a completely different mindset. And so the problem that we have here is that too much money and too much political power accrues to these people who, I repeat, are not necessarily bad people, but who do have a giant blind spot because they too have not managed to figure out how to make money from agroecology, just like us, right? So everybody is actually sharing that problem. And if together, and it pro probably come from consumer, uh, co um, sorry, community-based organizations, if together we can develop the political power to ensure that the collectivity funds the extension services necessary for mm -hmm. agroforestry and other forms of agroecological approaches, then we are going to get somewhere. As long as we sit here in the evening and uh, think we are great and the others are bad, or think that we can do it on our own, we will fail. It's not going to work. And there's a second reason why it's important to do it this way, is if you waste a very limited amount of political capital that we have, in fighting the big boys, then you are fighting a battle that's not actually relevant in the context of getting smallholder farmers to perform better here and now. So I'd much rather stroke them, stroke the Monsantos of this world in the right way and say, yes, yes, you're good guys. Now go and play in your sandpit and let the adults get on with agroecology. where the Monsanto and that are playing the free trade agreements now and making very, very active inroads <coughs> into consolidating Oh, I, I quite agree. It's a disaster, but I've got to choose my battle. My battle is the biophysics and the social mechanisms of agroforestry at the production level. Um, I think it would be more the, the battle of the, 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 our, our political representatives to understand how these extremely complex agreements can be tweaked or modified to protect the interests of small farmers or small fishermen. I just I, I can't contribute to that conversation. I, you know, I've tried to read a, a trade agreement once, and I wanted to commit suicide. <laughs> Yeah. 
we take one more question and then we we'll sum it up because I'd imagine we want to go home. As well. There's two people here. Look, two, to well, take the two together. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John Brennan, Leitrim Organic Farmers Co-op. And I don't really want to spend time asking questions, Patrick. I was really interested in your uh, presentation. We spent years at Group de Bruges level talking about agroecology, trying to fashion a more sustainable cap. Uh, I'd like to thank Ming for pinching an idea that we've been discussing for years. And uh, we've also made a submission ourselves um, as part of the cap reform on introducing agroforestry. Our approach has been that farms should be multifunctional in their approach. Tomorrow you will see situations that there are farms in this county that are organic since the 90s and now they've, they've taken on many new approaches and a lot of hardwood that's been planted maybe in the county was done even with no assistance um, and that through any schemes. So farmers are very willing to look at new approaches and um, it's great to have somebody from DG Envy here tonight as well because it's the environmental NGOs that are very much fashioning the new cap. They're sick of the rubbish that we talk about greening, which is just about big farmers holding on to money and doing nothing. And it's time that the smaller farmers and farmers west of the Shannon got paid for ecosystem services. Now, the co-op um, have discussed this, and our co-op as a community organization is willing to work very closely with people like Patrick, if he's available, to see how we could take this forward as a new paradigm for the integration of, of farming and forestry. As he said, and as I think our friend from Italy has also said, both of these have been kept apart because it suits the people, the big, the financiers. And I happened to be at a, a meeting in Dublin this week where I listened to somebody representing a forestry fund talking about the killing that they could make here in Ireland on short rotation Sitka spruce. I'm also glad that's the first time I've heard anybody saying uh, exactly how much Sitka spruce absorbs in terms of CO2 uh, tons per hectare, because we've had this discussion many times. So the, the question I would have is, number one, if we're willing to work with, with uh, people, how or what role we might play? And secondly, in, the, in, the, uh, in driving agroforestry forward, how we will avoid the mistakes of eliminating um, our biodiversity, because we can make mistakes we have very sensitive environments here. The curlew is on the edge of extinction. So I'd like just maybe the panel, maybe Patrick or whatever, to address that, how we, we do this without actually damaging the environment. Thank you. Yeah, we take one more question and then you can, that's it. Yeah. Um, Th thanks for the panel for coming over and um, seeing Leitrim and Roscommon today. Uh, John Matthews and um, I have a two cow place and I have uh, I work in the environment and it's the environment I'd like to uh, bring up because uh, Roberto mentioned it at the start and a lot of emphasis on SACs and SPAs, nature sites, but yet we're dealing with a much, much bigger issue here. 80% of our wildlife exists, our biodiversity exists outside of the Natura sites. And what I'm looking here is at a shifting baseline. When I grew up in Dublin, I had corncrake. They kept me awake in the 70s. I moved to Leitrim, and the shifting baseline, the corncrake were gone. Now the Greenland white front geese are gone. That's the Loch Rin flock, the Kilglass flock, the Loch Uchter flock. They're all gone. The red grouse and the midland bogs are gone. The curlew is going. And forestry is the big, you've mentioned blue whales and a lot of species, but the big elephant in the room is forestry. Because nobody can compete with it, with the companies. Because it has artificially inflated the price of the land next door to you to four times the price, and you cannot compete. So it's not about not being willing. You cannot afford to deal with multinationals and conglomerates that have a turnover and can use that money, the premiums that the taxpayer has funded, to actually buy the next farm beside you. And unfortunately, the areas they're actually buying are the high nature value and the areas with biodiversity. Only last Friday, I saw, out while out looking for curlew, didn't I see a certain coloured belt sign for forestry in heather. Actually, 
Annex 1 habitat planted up and approved by our own department. Annex 1 habitats, we're going to lose the cuckoo, we're losing the meadow planet, they're all going. I can see in 30 years a decline in the cuckoo population, the frequency, the abundance. I don't have the scientific data, and that's where you'll ch you can be challenged. Oh, what scientific proof? You can see it. If you live it, you see it. And it's happening, and it's, we have a sliding baseline that the children of today have never heard a corn creek. They don't know what a, cur uh, a curlew is. They don't know what a red grouse is. But what is the thing about Ireland that we say we protect them? How do we protect them? We say they're protected. What do we do to save the habitat that they require? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The hen harrier is going the same on the hills. I have photos of one site that's a flora protection order site. It has legally protected orchids on it that are 70% declined, so it's legally protected. That has been afforestated in a fraud underneath the REP scheme, underneath the Environmental Protection Scheme. 16 acres of high nature value, species rich, including legally protected orchids, approved by our own department. And who's funding it? Me and you, the taxpayer. This is criminal. And until we address that, with the forestry program of the government is the biggest threat to biodiversity in this country. Not abandonment, not overgrazing. Actually, the forestry program that's targeting the pages of the Book of Kells, that's what's happening. It's up in West Cavan. It's the areas of biodiversity, are the ones that's the, what is called marginal land that's been under attack by companies, and it's funded by the government's program. And that's to offset our carbon footprint. We'll carry on polluting, and the dairy farmer as well say, I'll offset it, I'll buy land up there to offset my carbon footprint, and I'll wreck West Cavan and Leitrim and the uplands. You probably saw enough forestry today and what the damage it's done. But I know, because I can see it for hen harriers, sites that have just been recently approved, it's not in an SPA. They didn't consult. They didn't consult when they're planting right up to the bog for the curlew, and we're losing them too. So that's at least four or five species gone in the time I'm here. Thank you for that. Cheers. You, you, you've put your finger on it, and it's an absolutely global problem. You might have heard of that study that came out last year from Germany where a bunch of uh, entomologists had simply measured the quantity of insects in protected areas and saw a massive drop. You might have seen last month a report coming out of France that there was a drop in bird populations in the landscape of 80% because of a lack of insects. We know in China they're already pollinating orchards by hand. In Zambia, I have friends who are complaining that there's no more pollinators in their landscape. In Zambia! And here, I just pulled it up, it's an article from the New Yorker magazine from 2015. It's about carbon capture, it's about birds, it's by a birder. And in there is just this one sentence, and he never comes back to it. He added that insect populations in Guanacaste had collapsed in the four decades he'd been studying them, and that he'd thought of describing the collapse in a paper. But what would be the point? It would only depress people. This is Costa Rica, which has the best network of protected areas in the whole of Latin America. This is an absolutely global problem. And you cannot pinpoint a particular pesticide or a particular intervention. What you can do is look at the massive industrialization of agriculture, which leaves no room in the landscape for anything except two species, the human and the plant he is growing in that monocrop field. And that is what we've got to get away from. And the politicians will help us get away from that if you guys become organized enough in Ireland, across the Union, to bang your fists on the table, together with the consumers, to say, stop, we need to change this, and we need to change it now. Uh, first on what Patrick just said, that's what I've tried to capture in the beginning. Yes, we are being the, the ones doing this six big uh, extinction crisis because of the way we expand, we develop, but we are also apparently intelligent beings and we can get awareness of this and change, uh, and change the situation if more and more people want to change it. I'm pretty much aware that biodiversity, European biodiversity, is not only within Natura 2000, for sure, that 80% we refer to, that's why we don't stick only to Natura 2000. 
and we address green and blue infrastructure ecosystem services and also the mm, let's say the the wider goals of the habitats directive do not are not contained only within Natura 2000. There's the connectivity between sites, there's the need to ensure species protection of those species listed, which are the sample, for sure. That only a sample we have. What Natura 2000 has a valuable, in my, in my view, first, we can demonstrate many places where the rhythm of loss was contained or even reversed, in some cases, in Natura 2000. But especially what it has as a, 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 of amazing is that it reverses the burden of proof at the continental scale. So we have around one-fifth of, uh, of continental Europe where it's for the developer to prove that it will not impact nature. And this is, this is powerful. Now, we can't do it ourselves in the Commission. We are not enough for that. And the, the rule of law says it's for the member states to do it. Of course, when things are done in such a way that the, 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 the rules of the game are not fulfilled by member states, there are complaints, infringements, our own initiative. You, you have a, a noticeable example. Recently, the Polish government had decided to log the Bialowieża forest. Well, we went into court, we won, and that, that stopped purely because it's Natura 2000 and there was some commitments. So we can do something on that. So it's not for me to judge Irish forestry policy. Is it the major threat or not? Whatever it is, it must uh, obey by European law in Natura 2000, Birds and Habitats Directive, for appropriate assessment and so forth. So, and we, in terms of the forestry system, it was subject to a state aid case in the context of which the 30% broadleaf was negotiated. So we are also pretty attentive and dialoguing with Ireland to see how we, we can get into that. But I think the main issue is you can't solve the situation without politics. And politics in democracies are influenced by uh, public opinion. Not just immediately like that. So what you need to bring if you have these concerns on forestry, on on uh, Natura 2000, on, on the marginal lands where the value is, well, I think that's quite some public debate around in Ireland around it. So make your voice heard, bring more people to agree with you, and for sure then Irish politics could change and then face the corporations that are behind. The power, the, the power of the voter is quite relevant, and I think that while we are all getting more urban, you'll find more allies to the cause because townies, urbanites, happen to like nature. All right, um, we leave it there, as they say. Um, I just want to say before we finish, uh, thanks so much to uh, the group of farms that uh, took time today to meet us and to show us around, and uh, uh, thanks as well to Masonite uh, for facilitating us and listening to our concerns and our ideas and our suggestions. And really, uh, as I've said earlier, this isn't going to end here, because it was pointless doing it if we were just going to end here. What we've got to do from here now is get the relevant expert uh, for agroforestry for this area, uh, with the help of Patrick, put together a study uh, and basically put it out there as an alternative review of the forestry strategy because uh, I think anyone who's looked at the review of the forestry strategy uh, and read it and had a good look at it and if they were honest to themselves, they'd say that really uh, people weren't taken into account on this review, people's concerns weren't listened to. Certain, I know NGOs put in certain concerns and they were basically ignored. So we can go around, we can complain about the midterm review and say it's this, that and the other, or we can go out there and do our own one. And I'd only be delighted to work with you, John. The more help we can get, the better, because 
Um, one of the reasons why we brought Enda uh, Stenson with us today and uh, Jerry was because, well, we're blow-ins. I'm a blow-in. I know I just come from down the road, but I'm a blow-in to this area. And we don't, and you're working well for a blow-in, but we, you just don't know as much as it, and you couldn't know as much as it uh, about it as the people of the area. No more than I know every part of Clune Chambers bog inside out. It doesn't mean you have less of an understanding of the land because you don't know it. It's because you're from there. So having gone out and met with those people and spoken to those people, we basically got to go off now and work out where do we take it from here and at the end of this process we will produce some sort of a document that as I've said earlier will be given to the Department of Agriculture will be given to DG Envy and DG Agri and it says a lot about my experience in the European Parliament I have a lot of concerns about the European Union I would say in a lot of ways I'm a skeptic I'm turning into a Europhile in certain aspects and one of them that turns me in that direction is the fact that when I pick up the phone or I send an email to DG Envy or DG Agri, I wouldn't say it about a lot of the other DGs, but they come back to me straight away and they talk to me. And even sometimes they come up and meet with me in my office. Unbelievable. Whereas if I went and I was to try and talk to the department, bar sitting outside their house for a couple of weeks in a row, I probably wouldn't get to meet them. So um, it isn't all doom and gloom. I, I went out there okay I'm radical I think in this way and I think it would be a good idea to go down a certain road and now I find myself when I'm out there I am not actually radical in that sense at all because actually the prevailing winds are and I never thought I'd hear Phil Hogan say this and I never thought I'd hear a member from the same group as Fine Gael say this say this listen to this we cannot pay people on what they were doing 27 years ago. Now they're saying that. That's fantastic. I have heard Phil Hogan, whether he believes it or not, but he's saying it, and that's what he's saying at the moment. He is saying that people on marginal land should be given support to survive just as much or more as people on what would have been traditionally classed as really good land. So, in a way, my job at this stage potentially isn't to change what the Commission want to do, it is in certain senses, but it's to make sure that it's not warped and bastardised and twisted when it gets back here. Because one of the things that was said by Marion Harkin when she was in here last, and she doesn't praise herself enough, she said, well in the end we failed on the last ca cap. Actually in the European Parliament they didn't fail. It was possible for this government to have given an awful lot more money to Leitrim. So, in fact, in this case, I think Europe is actually doing the right thing. And that's what I actually believe. Hopefully, hopefully, it won't be twisted and it won't be mangled when it's brought through our doll. Now, initially, when I heard it's going to be decided more locally, I was worried that it would be just within the department. And an awful, awful lot of this will happen within the department. But now I understand that there's going to be a debate, a discussion about it in the Dáil, where the detail is hammered out. And you'll have people like, and you're, you're well worth your place in Dáil Air and Martin Kenny, will have people like him there? Will have people like Michael Fismaris, comes from a slightly different end of the political spectrum, but he feels the same way as you do about farming. You have people like Eamon O'Queeve, who is in Fianna Fáil, I would say maybe they don't listen to him enough, but this will all be debated openly at the Agri Committee, etc. And basically, I think it might go well from the European perspective. My only worry is, will it be twisted here? But hopefully people like Martin Kenny, people like Michael Fitzmaurice will actually be able to make sure that that doesn't happen. Because if the money does go more so, more so towards uh, environmentally sensitive areas and people are farming in more difficult areas, it's fairly obvious to see who will benefit. We'll benefit in these areas. So now is the time to fight for it. I'll finish on this. There was a big hoo-ha and a massive amount of talk, and I was even dragged into going to one of the events in Sligo, about Ireland 2040 and where we're going to be, and the tens of billions of euros that were going to be spent. 
And sure, it would be great if they were. But they are maybe money. Maybe if growth goes, it grows at a certain level, maybe they might spend it. Maybe they might spend it here. I don't actually think they will. Maybe they might. They're all maybes, ifs, and we all got very excited about it. We've now got to get not equally excited, but more excited about what could be even with the 5% cut, we could be talking over the lifetime of cap between the money the state puts into it and the EU puts into it, we could be talking about 9 to 10 billion euros. So if we can shout it from the rooftops what we're going to do with the national plan and think about it in such depth about potentially imaginary money, we've really, really, really got to think about this. We've got to get it right. And I'd say most importantly, we've got to get it right, because I think this is the last chance we'll get to get it right. Because I can't see many farmers hanging on for another six and seven years on really low payments, and I can't see farming surviving that long to wait another six or seven years before we see generational renewal, that buzz phrase. I don't know what it meant before, now I do. We need it to work now, so now is the time. Get involved, and they said the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Keep nagging at your local politician. Whether you're a townie, and I've got to get the townies to start doing this, and tap them on the head and remind them, you want a good deal this time. Because you were told the last time, wait until or two. And I remember all the smart ones among you going, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. But by God, you ended up with no bird. You ended up with bloody nothing. You know that now. You know what went wrong the last time. We've got to make sure it doesn't go wrong again. We'll leave you there. Thanks very much for coming. And <laughs> Chucky Allah.